that. Click on that. That. <clears throat> I think that we're all good. Cool. Clock is going. That's going. Microphone seems to be working. Okay, good. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm coming to you from a pretty windy, stormy, blustery sort of Sunday here in uh, the middle of Wisconsin. Let's see. We've got a lot of people already into the uh, the, the chat, which is awesome. We've got Winnipeg, Canada. We've got the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, North Essex, UK, uh, sunny California. We've got the great state of Texas, Iowa, California, Florida, um, Chile, Vinegrove, Kentucky, Scotland, uh, Belfast, Arkansas, Denver, Windy City, Cancun, Mexico, uh, Jakarta, Germany. We've got Moderator Matt in the chat, um, which means Chicago-ish. Well, Chicago, really. Um, Ipswich, Baltimore, Columbus, Seattle, Stoke on Tent, Trent, sorry, not Tent. Um, Schaumburg, which is kind of Chicago-ish, really. It's a little bit west of Chicago, and that's where Adepticon is. Um, Dartford, Massachusetts, Madison, Wisconsin, Northern Illinois, Austria, Michigan, Calgary, Alberta, Portsmouth, UK, Japan, Plain Old Ohio. Well, it's still, you know, it's pretty cool. Uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Jacksonville, Meadows, Canada, Pitt Meadows, Canada, Asheville, North Carolina, Philadelphia, Sweden, Poland, Cincinnati, Mars. Really? Well, the internet's gotten a lot better there. <clears throat> Nebraska, Denmark, Singapore. Uh, George says, morning again from St. Augustine. Just noticed that the topic for today was going to be terrain. Very useful since the girlfriend and I are painting up some terrain and some chaos for a friend's birthday next weekend. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. Paris, France. Uperland. Uh, Sydney, Australia. Cyprus. Turkey. Uh, Madrid. Um, also Madison, Wisconsin. You guys should, uh, you know, play some games. Um, lots of Florida representation today. Hearing any American say Stoke on Tent, Trent is so strange, like, especially since I keep saying it. Uh, to be fair, hearing it anything other than a Stokey accent always sounds odd to me. Well, that, yeah, that happens. I'm always told that, though I don't feel like I have much of an accent, I am told that I do... Especially when I say the state that I live in. Other people say the state. Every, other people say Wisconsin differently, but everyone thinks that people who live here generally say it weird, which is strange since it's our place. You know what I mean? We should. Anyway. Um, salutations from Mordor. It's um, probably not great there, you know, but then I guess it never really has been. Or maybe it has been a long time ago, but lately, not so much. Um, what else have we got here? Brian Griffith says, told my friendly local game store about Game 4 yesterday. They're going to think they're going to sign up. That's cool. We've been getting lots of signups, and uh, it's been going well. We actually, on Thursday and Friday, we were considering, or we were starting to work on um, kind of what our convention schedule is going to be for 2019, uh, where we're going to go, what we're going to do. Um, right now, for sure, we're going to the Reno Gamma trade show, which is not a public event particularly. It's mainly just for stores and manufacturers and stuff like that. So that one's definitely one we're going to go to, and then we're making kind of plans after that. I mean, we'll be at Adepticon. We're not going to have a booth or anything, but we'll be at Adepticon. Um, I mean, obviously, I'll be there, uh, but um, other folks are going to be there as well, so that's going to be good. Sergio says, I know topics terrain, but have you seen the new Holiday Battle Force boxes? They were leaked. I saw some picture. It looked like a photograph of like a magazine or catalog page or something. It was sort of at an odd angle, and I did see that there were like 10 Battle Forces. I think six of them were 40K, and four of them were, I think, Age of Sigmar. It was like Deepkin... Uh, 
Daughters of Cain, Seraphon, and uh, Slaves of Chaos, I think. And then for the, I think for 40K, it was like regular Space Marines, also Imperial Fists, which I thought was interesting. I think there was Eldar, Necrons, something else. I don't know. Um, the Battle Force boxes, for those of you that don't know, like normally during Christmas time, they basically just make these special boxes and then they just put a whole bunch of junk in there. And then in theory, I think that you get a discount. I mean, you didn't used to. What has what used to happen was when they would have these big Battle Force boxes, what you saved was extra clicks because it, if you added up all the retail value of all the stuff that was in there, it would be the exact same price as what they were selling it for, but you only had to click once. So you were saving clicks, not money, though. Nowadays, I think that they save money. I mean, Lord knows that those uh, start collecting boxes are way cheaper than they, all those parts would be retail. Um, but I don't know about the Battle Force because I don't know that I've seen the prices yet. So, But yeah, they do those during Christmas, and it's a big thing. Um, um, although I think the last couple of years, they've only done maybe two or three. So the fact that it looks like they're doing ten this year is pretty cool. Uh, pretty interesting, yeah. Reflex Dog Training says, Building a modular 4x8 table right now, and I need some help with Crackle. I've tried the Crackle Medium and the Chipping Medium. I'm from Vallejo, and they both suck any recommendations. Um, about the only Crackle paint stuff that I ever use is the, the texture paint that GW makes, um, which, if you're doing an entire board, is probably not going to help, because that stuff is not cheap. It comes in a tiny little pot, like the size of a normal paint can, or paint pot, whatever. Um, one thing I have noticed about Crackle, and this is also kind of a bummer, is that it works best when you put it on really thick. If you just paint like a thin layer on, it will barely do anything. But when you paint a big, thick... Carlson. One of the kitties was sounding very sad. Um, when you paint a big, thick layer of... Uh, you know, of the, the, the crackle paint on there, it takes like forever to dry, but when it does, it makes then really big cracks. The other thing that I've found with crackle paint, and this would probably not necessarily uh, be an issue for you with a terrain board, but I have found that crackle paint doesn't stick to plastic super well. So if you're going to put crackle paint on, and the way that most people use that stuff is they use it at the end. I always use it like, I put the crackle paint on before I prime because I'm going to prime over it and then I'm going to paint it the color that I want and do all that kind of stuff, which I know is weird. Most people don't do that. But what I've found is if you put crackle paint directly onto plastic, it falls off pretty easily. Whereas if you prime or do something else to the plastic first and then put the crackle paint over it, then it sticks a lot better. And like I said, since most people use it the way it's intended, which means it's kind of a last step then there's obviously already primer and paint and crap like that on the bases. But because I do it weird, that's when I noticed that it was a, an issue. So, yeah. Melanie Dawn says, oh, no, like, sad kitty. It, Carlson sometimes makes noises like he's very sad when he's letting us know he's going to go and drink water in the bathroom. I'm not sure why. He just does it. He's weird. Um, he's a very, he's a, he's a, he's a definition of a scaredy cat. Um, so, yeah. Daryl Park says there's a crackle paste out there put out by a company called Golden. Golden's a big, um, like, art supply. Like, you don't get it so much, like, at hobby stores as much as you get it more, like, at art supply stores and craft stores. You're, I know Michael's. There's a, Michael's is, has got a lot in, here in, in America. I uh, should be able to find it at proper art stores like Michael's or Blick Art Supplies, as he went on to say. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Let's see here. James says, looming forward to... To the ruined Sector Mechanicus set that Pretty ordered yesterday. I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, the I did I ordered the um, Realm of Battle board that was the that's like the Sector Mechanicus you know battle board the big four by six thing. I ordered that um, from my local store. I don't know three four weeks ago it showed up, and there was a day recently where it didn't suck too much outside yet, and so I primed it. I could have primed it, well, I was going to say I could have primed it with airbrush, but that would have taken forever. And each of those panels is two foot by two foot, so I don't even, and they, they would have fit in my in my paint room, but they would have been very un very awkward. So I wanted to use um, Krylon to uh, the, the, the camo stuff because I knew it would also stick to the plastic a lot better. So I was able to prime that stuff. I didn't prime all six panels because I'm going to be using it for Kill Team Battle Reports, so I really only did three. I should have only done two, but as it turned out, one of them I picked 
I felt like it looked like it had bowed a bit, so I just grabbed another one that was the exact same and then painted that it didn't look as bowed, and I primed that. Um, so anyway, we'll see how that works out, but that's part of some of my terrain stuff. As soon as I get done with the most recent Kill Team uh, list, which I'm just about probably going to get finished with either today or tomorrow, then I'm going to be moving into terrain so that I can start doing my, my battle reports. Um, let me see here. Bases of Operations says, I buy Viva Crackle Paste from eBay. I've never tried that out. Hmm. I'll have to try that out. Um, let me see. Emperor Wheels says, The GW Crackle stuff, dry with a hair dryer on hot, GW wash, dry brush, sticks well and looks spot on. I, I like the Crackle stuff for, like, bases. You know what I mean? Like I said. Um, but again, like I said, I also generally don't use it at the color it's supposed to be because I usually put it on before I prime and then I, I paint over it kind of a little bit later and throw some washes and some dry brush like you said but I yeah I just have always done it that way I don't like doing it last step I you know because the other thing too is then you can't like it's very difficult to put it on like if you want to change the color if you've got the red stuff like the Mars kind of crackle paint stuff but you wanted to actually do it more of a dark brown well you know it's kind of hard, but if you put it down and get the texture of it and then prime over the top of it and all that stuff, then you can paint it whatever the heck color you want when you're done. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, geez. Furnace is about to kick in and it'll make a lot of noise, so I'm going to turn it off real quick. I forgot to do that before the show. Um, so, yeah, I've got an app on my phone that's for the thermostat, so I can turn that off. Okay, now it'll hopefully work. Um, yeah, the the time change didn't mess me up that much, but it's a little squirrely. I don't know. We'll just say that. <clears throat> Theo says, "What do you think about permanent stuck down terrain boards for Sigmar? I think boards like that are more immersive, despite not being as modular." Well, I mean, since the, today's topic is kind of about terrain, I. I like all different types of game boards. I like um, just like battle mats, although they have their uses. Like they're they're quick and easy, and they're great, and they're great for transport and be able to get them around and stuff like that. And they're also great to store. Like I've got a bunch of them at the studio, and they're just all rolled up in those little cases they come with. And then I stick them on a shelf, and it's fine. Um, big, you know, cool three dimensional non-modular sculpted fancy terrain is also amazing looking but it's a transportation i don't want to say nightmare but it can be problematic depending how big it is um there's some guys down in the southern part of wisconsin the southeast wisconsin battle badgers and um, they do a lot of demos at stores and, and conventions and stuff like that if you've been to adepticon you've probably seen a bunch of their um flames of war stuff and, uh, but they also do, at, like at TMX, they were doing Malifaux and Flames of War. Um, two years ago, they brought, a, like the first year for TMX, they brought this huge kind of point to hawk. Like, you know, you get there at the water, and then there's the huge cliff, and then there's the, all that. And they, that was a gorgeous, gorgeous board, but it's four by eight. You need to bring it places in a truck, you know what I mean? And there's got to be some place to store it and all that stuff. So those are problematic. I like modular boards too because then what's nice is that you can kind of tweak it and change it around a little bit. But I mean, the prettiest obviously are just completely fully sculpted boards, but they take a lot of time. They take a lot of place to store. They're a pain to transfer or move or transport, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's up to personal preference and also up to your application, like what you're doing with it. If you're taking it to a convention, it's really hard to lug that board. But if it's really easy to just throw up one of those little pouches over your shoulder that's got, you know, like a rolled up four by six mat in it. So it totally depends. <clears throat> Let's see here. Basis of operation says, I think storage is the biggest problem with set terrain boards. Yeah, I mean, totally. If, if you... If you're doing it, let's say you've got a basement and that's where you play your games and you've got like one board that you set up all the time and you keep it there, then all you have to really do is dust it. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah. Um, Jay Tick says, good morning from sunny South Milwaukee. Oh, see, it's not sunny up here. It's all windy and weird up here. And it's supposed to be rainy all day. Um, What have we got here? MDL or I can't. Modeler 
can do anyway. Uh, any tips on doing pin washes? I do most of my larger areas with an airbrush and have trouble with the pin washes getting out of the intended area and messing up the airbrushed surface. Um, I've never really been a big fan personally of doing pin washes, but I've watched videos about it. So let me tell you about that. Generally, what you see with people who are going to do pin washes is that they get like the paint of the rest of the model to a point where they like it. And then you take uh, like an airbrush and you spray a gloss varnish over the whole model. And what that does is it locks down the paints that you've already laid in there. And then, uh, but you've made it a glossy surface. Now, you're not going to want to obviously generally end that way. You usually want to have more of a matte surface, but that'll come later. So you've you've made this glossy surface, and now you can take whatever wash you're going to be using, whether it's a normal acrylic type wash, or whether it's a, a enamel wash, or even an oil wash, whatever. And then you can do the pin washes. And because it's on a glossy surface, it won't bleed into the matte surface of the paint. It won't be able to bleed into the paint at all because it'll be covered with a gloss. So if it gets out of the pin or out of the, let's say, panel lines, if you're doing like a tank or some sort of vehicle like that, if it gets away from you, you can usually take like a, a Q-tip or an earbud or whatever they call those, you know, and um, some, depending on the material, whether it's water or mineral spirits or whatever, and you can usually clean it up or even basically just go, well, I'm going to just start over on this one line, and then you can kind of drag it through there. And then once you get the lines all done with your panel washing and get everything the way you like it, then you can spray a gloss coat again over it, or a matte coat, or whatever you're going to be doing next, and then paint from there. A lot of people will keep those panel lines towards the end, um, and then once you've you know done your gloss coat over most of the paint, then you do your panel lines, and then sometimes people will then right away go to their final kind of matte cover, whatever kind of spray you might be using for matte, um, a matte surface, and then take it from there. Um, but yeah, like I said, I've never been, I don't know. I, for me, panel lines, I generally like to just have the model itself. If it's a big enough vehicle, I feel like the, the, the subtlety of the shadow that is actually made up from the three-dimensionality of the panel line does good enough. I don't, I'm not a big super high contrast painter frequently, so there's that. But, um, yeah, so that's where that's 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 the that's the thing that I know about is that when you're concerned about doing panel lines, the way to not be concerned about it, or a lot of different like type oil type washes and things like that, like if you need like engine soot or stuff like that, you know, or like a lot of drippy, you know, if you want to have it look like the the rivets are rusting and running down, what a lot of people will do is they will lock down the previous paint and cover it all in a gloss coat so that you don't goof up as badly if you cover things poorly or you can still clean it up pretty well. Um, this is what I've been told. Oh, let me see here. What else have we got? Storm says, hey Adam, I just found your video on wet palettes and I started using it last night and it helped out a bunch and I just wanted to say thanks for the great tip. Well, you're welcome. Um, I got the great tip originally from Sam, Sam Lenz, uh, painting with the pro Sam Lenz, which by the way, uh, Sam and I painted, or painted, we filmed three or four videos yesterday uh, in the studio. Um, I took a picture and then I didn't put it on Instagram. Hmm. Well, I'll have to do that today. Uh, but yeah, so we filmed some stuff yesterday and um, he's the one who originally taught me about wet palette and I frankly cannot paint without it for the most part now. Like it just feels weird. Like every once in a while you go to like, I went to a convention recently um, in Detroit and there was a little, uh, there was uh, actually moderator Matt was running a paint and take with uh, wreckage models. And um, it was fun, and it worked out well, but I found myself going, oh, man, because, like, you just, you know, you're used to doing it a certain way, and you're like, oh, but it I wouldn't work out real great for, for Matt, I don't think, to also supply everybody with a wet palette at the paint and take. I mean, you're not supposed to be there to do your best work. You're there just to, to learn stuff, and generally it's for people who are kind of getting new into it and everything like that. But, yeah, it's um, the wet palette, the big main deal is that when you, when you add a little bit of water to your paints to thin your paints, they that water will evaporate quicker than the paint will sometimes by itself and so your paints will dry out quicker if you're just using like a piece of paper or a, a plastic you know palette or a piece of tile but if you put it on a wet palette that paint that you're watering down will stay moist longer um i've had some people reach out to me and go well I, you know i didn't use my wet palette for two weeks and i came back my paints were all weird well it won't it's not going to keep your paints perfect forever your paints will generally separate 
sometimes even as early as overnight. It depends on the paint. Like Vallejo paints I've noticed separate on the palette, not right away, but like overnight, you know. So it's not a I'll be able to keep this paint wet for weeks kind of a situation, but it will definitely be able to keep your paint wet for hours as you are painting, you know, on, on a project. And it's not like when I first started, I was using a literally a ceramic tile as my palette and I would add a little water to water it out. And in a minute it would be dry, you know? So, um, that, that's, that's really what the wet palette's good for. So, um, Hi, Adam. Do you see the terrain of tabletop troubadour games? The tested YouTube channel do a review of massive terrain, but I don't know if it works with GW scale. If, if it's the stuff that they just posted on there a while back when they were in New Zealand at Weta Workshops, um, I think it's 28 millimeter scale, but I don't know. That stuff was amazing looking. This guy who works at Weta wanted to build like some terrain that was kind of like the movie Labyrinth. And then like that was, I don't know, it, 20 months ago and then a couple months ago Adam Savage came back and the guy and he had this guy at the time it had like maybe like a, a four foot table of it done and when Adam came back with the crew from Tested on the on, you know his, his YouTube channel this guy now had like an 18 foot table of it done and I guess Weta is going to 3D scan all of it and then they're going to do a, maybe a Kickstarter or something like that and sell the 3D scans so you can 3D print your own stuff. But this stuff looked amazing, if this is what you're talking about. It looked amazing. I don't know. I think if it's 3D scan and you're going to be printing your own, you can make it whatever the hell scale you want, which would be a pretty good idea. Um, any comment on Hagglethorn Hollow so far? That name sounds familiar, but I don't remember. I don't know what that is. Um... Matthew Sears says, I, bought, I brought two wet palettes for the paint and take. Oh, I, but I guess I didn't see them, or, or I don't remember. Um, the, yours is the most recent paint and take I've been to, so maybe that's what it was, too. Maybe I just, maybe I, maybe your paint and take was totally fine, but I have, at the past, been at paint and takes that didn't have wet palettes, and then, I just, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, hmm... Wet palette has been a lifesaver for getting smoother surfaces with my acrylics, says Dylan. Yeah, no, that really does help too, I agree. Um, oh, everything's getting all wiggly over here. Paul B says this stuff was 28 millimeter, the, the wet a workshop stuff, yeah. Um, let me see here. Brian says using distilled water and keeping a penny or two in your wet palette can make your paint stay moist and make your paper your paper live longer for months. Huh, that's weird. See, like I someone actually asked a question just recently about wet palette. They're like, how long do you keep the parchment paper in there? And I, because my palette's relatively small, I keep my my palette I keep my parchment paper in there until I run out of space. And then I have to kind of clean it out and put a new piece of parchment paper in there. But I'm using like one of those like sandwich boxes, you know, you've seen it in the video. I'm still using that same one, you know, years later, but it's like, you know, size of a piece of bread or whatever. So yeah, there's not a lot of space there. Um, I know that, um, that Sam also, you know, uses, he uses um, uh, new pieces of paper pretty frequently, you know, so um, that's also a big deal. Oh, <laughs> Hagglethorn Hollow is the terrain that you were just talking about by Weta, right, okay. Still, the name does not struck with me yet. I just keep thinking of the stuff from Tested with, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Right. Um, yeah, no, that stuff was amazing looking. Like, the, especially how modular it was. Um, like the way you could take, like, the second floor off of, like, a building and then put it onto a different building and then take that one and put it over here and switch the roofs. And they just looked right all the time. Like, it was a super, it was just amazing looking job. So it makes total sense that at the very least, and this is the thing that's interesting too, is that they, it won't take them because they already have the 3D scanning stuff there, probably for you know Hollywood movie magic shenanigans that they do all the time. For them to just take those pieces, 3D scan them, clean up the scans a bit, and then sell them, uh, you know, or you know, kickstart them or whatever. Just like it's very little other than the time. There's basically no um, materials cost and that kind of stuff. And if the work is mostly done at this point, which maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, hopefully they shouldn't be late, you know, because they don't have to worry about like getting things manufactured and, you know, delays and whatnot. They just have to basically get the files done and then they can, you know, ship them and they don't even have to ship them. They just email them or whatever. Um, 
Oh, now Chris Taylor here says that they changed their mind about the 3D files for the terrain. They won't be doing that. They'll just be selling the terrain. It's mad expensive. Okay, well, that's a stupid idea, in my opinion. Um, yeah, that's the exact opposite of what I was saying. That seems like a terrible idea. But, okay, I mean, if they wanted to sell a bunch... Because here's the thing about 3D files. I've bought 3D files before, and yeah, they're cheap, but, you know, I've bought a bunch of 3D files because I think, hey, these are really cool, and a bunch of them I haven't used. So there are people that will buy 3D files and very possibly never use them, but they'll buy them because they're not that expensive. But when you say to someone, look, this piece of terrain costs $100 or $300, people will be less likely to buy them. So, huh, that's that's dumb. All right, well, that's... I take back what I said, that they've, they've, <laughs> they've not done something smart, in my opinion. That's too bad, too. Because I like, I mean, uh, they're the same guys that did um, uh, that, ro that robot game. Uh, Giant Killer Robots, Heavy Hitters. And I like that quite a bit. That's really cool. Um, yeah, that's dumb. Why would they want to go through all that work? and Because they have to pour all the resin and then, ugh, ugh. Make some 3D files. That's what I would do. Um, let's see here. What else have we got? Um, Kelly asks, is that red, gat, red grass wet palette worth trading up? I have the Masterson wet palette. Um, I know Sam still uses his Masterson. I still use my sandwich box. Um, it depends. My concern, my only concern with any other kind of wet palette is then you have to keep kind of buying the paper because it's like pre-cut or whatever. I mean, I guess you could cut your own paper and stick it in there, sure. That's what I do with the sandwich box. I just use baking parchment. But the upside, I think, is that sometimes I think the paper that they use, like Masterson uses, is maybe a little better as a wet palette parchment than, say, the junk that I get at Aldi or at the grocery store or whatever. Um, so, yeah, it's it's kind of a horse apiece. Um, uh, James here says the Masterson's paper leaves paper fiber in your paints. I could see that maybe. Um, you know, it depends again how much uh, you know how much paint you put down. We were talking a little bit about this yesterday, and Sam was saying that he always he gets people that ask him on his on his Twitch channel. And if you don't follow, if you're into Twitch and you don't follow Sam on Twitch, you should follow Sam on Twitch. It's Samson Arts, I believe, on Twitch. So I think it might be twitch.tv slash Samson Arts. Anyway. Um, he uh, he was saying that people ask him why he puts so little pa so paint down on his uh, on his palette, and he's like, well, you know, how much do you like? He's basically saying he doesn't see why you would put so much on your palette because if you're painting people, they're very small, you know. So if he needs more, he'll put down more as opposed to putting down a whole bunch and then not using it and then wasting paint. So um, yeah, I guess with the paper fibers, depends on how long it's going to sit there and that kind of stuff. I don't know. I've not used the Masterson one, so I don't really know. Um, I've been basically happy with the weird stuff that I get from the, the grocery store. Um, I mean, it's a pain in the butt to cut, but other than that, I mean, just to get it the right size and then all that stuff. But once it's in there, it's fine, so. Um, Kelly asks, I am having such a blast painting and building my kill teams, I've totally ignored my Shade Spire stuff. Do you ever feel ashamed that you do things like that? It's just my jam now. Um, the trick is, is that there's... There's, you can always go back, you know, like right now you're working on Kill Team stuff and you're having a good time with that. And then at some point, you know, you can decide, you know what, I'm really itching to play some Shade Spire so you can go back and do that. The trick, again, is the fact that they're all so small in model count. If it was a situation where like, like back in the day where you're like, oh, I just, I can't really decide whether I want to play 40k with a 2,000 point army that's like, you know, Tyranids and it's 150 models. Or if I want to play Warhammer Fantasy with like, you know, Orcs and Goblins. Just like 150 to 200 models for whatever you know point cost, 2200 points. You know, switching back and forth between those two seems a little daunting, obviously, because there's so much to it. And you'll be, when are you ever going to get one of them finished? But if you're like, man, I just you know, I, I'm going to switch back to my orcs for Shadespire. That's four dudes, you know. And then uh, after you get those guys done, then you can switch back to your um, gray knights for uh, kill team, which is maybe five. So. You know, you have those abilities. You have those, those those benefits to skirmish games. You know, any kind of skirmish game is one of the reasons why I'm such a big fan of skirmish games is because they are kind of bite sized and you can kind of buffet sort of, you know, test and taste and, and move around and things like that. And sometimes, like, I don't... 
there are some people that are like, you should only ever play one game because then you can, you know, completely dedicate yourself to that one game. I, I'm just not that, you know, for gaming, I'm just not that guy. So, um, Julian says that the P3 palette, oh, that's right, I forgot they made one. Uh, the P3 palette is fine if you use it with paper towel and then the parchment, as opposed to, you see, I'm not sure about the sponges. I don't know, I've always liked paper towel better. Um, like, it, it's cheap, you know, but yeah. Peter asks, how do I get people in my local gaming group to try other tabletop games than 40k? Uh, the way you get people to try anything other than whatever they're already doing is to, well, it kind of leads back into the skirmish thing. Like, if, let's say, you wanted to get people into Malifaux, um, then you would need to build and paint two Malifaux crews, which, again, most Malifaux, like, most starter crews are six to eight figures, roughly. So you paint two crews, and then you talk to one of your friends in your club, or you go to the local shop and talk to whoever, and you go, hey, let, let's, let me teach you how to play Malifaux. You can try it out, and you can use these guys, and I'll use these guys. Or let them pick, or whatever you want to do. And then, um, yeah, because if you say, hey, you should really start playing this game that I like, and you should go buy it and build it and everything like that, that's a hard sell. People are going to be like, mm, well, why would I do that? But if you say, here, you know, you're basically giving them a demo, it, you can do that, and it's easy. Now, if you decided you wanted to do that with some sort of historical game, you're going to need two forces for that. And if it's something like Saga, that's relatively small. But if it's some game that there's, you know, 150 models per army, that's not necessarily going to be easy for you to paint two forces and then teach somebody how to play it. Smaller games, like Skirmish games, like Wreckage, like Malifaux, like... Um, or even getting into stuff like Kill Team and whatnot, you know, that kind of stuff. But you're saying you want to get away from 40K. You, you know, you've got those options, and then that can really help you sort of teach somebody quickly. Um, but it's, again, not a huge investment, both in time and money, on your part. Because, you know, like I said, in just from what I remember, Malifaux crews were between 40 and 50 bucks, you know, each. So, you know, that's an option. Uh, let me see here. Space Iguana says, I started my first terrain build. It's an Old West town made with hot glue and popsicle sticks. Looks weird to have space marines in it. Well, yeah. I mean, theme is is important, um, I will admit. It, you know, that, that happens. Um, yeah. That's one of the reasons, I honestly think that's one of the reasons why they wrote the story for Malifaux uh, the way they did. Because the thing about Malifaux is when they when they found the city of Malifaux by going through this rip in reality to this other dimension and all that jazz, um, it was talking about how the, the, the architecture there was so strange because it seemed like a mix of all cultures and there was Egyptian stuff and Old West stuff and sci-fi stuff and all that jazz. And as I was reading this in the book, and I'm like, uh-huh, I'm thinking to myself, from a designer standpoint, that's pretty smart because then you can just basically allow people to use whatever the heck terrain they already have. That's that's a that's a that's a bright move. When you tell, well, yeah, no, our our game system, it's uh, multi-dimensional, and there's all kinds of stuff. Okay, great. That, so I can use my Egyptian stuff and my you know uh, old West, cool, and this office building, boom, done. You know, and so um, I think that's kind of a smart idea, but it doesn't work for obviously all the games. Yes. Um, what else do we have here? Jay Tick says he uses the P3 palette. It's awesome in general. I don't need anything extra. Uh, regularly use that one, and he gets good results. Actually, he does. I know Jay, and he does paint very well, and he does get good results. I keep meaning to pick up. Next time I'm at a convention that Pete, that uh, Privateer Press is at, I should pick up one of those, um, one of theirs, and try it out. Jacob Sims says, hey, man, first time here. Love your channel. Thanks for the dedication and effort. Much appreciated. Well, I appreciate that you appreciate it. Thank you very much for watching. Um, Julian Wolf says, if you played the campaign version of Kill Team, I found that the point escalation and adding models has become a money pit. Um, I have not as of yet. I've been looking it over and kind of like trying to figure out how that's going to work. I kind of want to do a small campaign uh, battle report at some point, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm looking at it from that aspect. I'm building... I mean, right now, most of my Kill Teams are all designed to just basically be 100 point you know, for match play and not do the whole roster thing that you're supposed to do where you have all these guys and then you pick 100, you know, and then you tailor your list and all that jazz. I'm going to get there eventually, but to start, I basically just painted up 100-point lists. And then, except for my Imperial Guard, my Imperial Guard is a bigger 
conglomeration of people, and so that's kind of heading towards that sort of campaign system. Even, I think, at the far end in campaign, I think it's not going to be that much of a money pit in comparison to any other, like, large army game, you know. Um, but, yeah, so we'll see how that goes out. Uh, question, what was the piece from Ikea that people tend to recommend to store display your minis? I'm pretty sure Uncle Adam has mentioned it here before. It's called a Deltoff or a Detloff. Something like that. It starts with a D, D-E-L. It's either Deltoff or Detloff. But I'm pretty sure it starts with a D, it ends with an F. It's about 60 or 65 bucks. Um, I'm getting people who are saying Detolf, which is also nearly the same thing that I just said. But yeah, check that out. Do some searches you should be able to find. Uh, yes, Det Detolf, 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 something like that. Um, they weigh like a zillion pounds. Okay, that's not true. But for such a small box that it comes in, because it's all flat pack, it weighs like 100 pounds because it's a lot of glass. Um, so that's, you know, but um, they're crazy cheap. So they, they, and they work really nice. So yeah, definitely. Um, Samir says, discovered a new skirmish game, Burrows and Badgers. Such incredible opportunity for amazing real world terrain. Yeah, I have, uh, Osprey sent me a copy of that a while back and I've not played it, but I've looked at the book and it's interesting. Like, basically what it is, is it's, um, it's a little bit like if you guys have heard of Mouse Guard, which I think was a comic or a graphic novel, and then maybe also a role-playing game. But it's kind of like a vaguely medieval kind of game, but it's all, you know, animals, anthropomorphized animals. So it's, um, you know, badgers and, and burrows and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, I don't have any... It's one of those games where you'd be like, okay, that's cool. I would have to completely shift gears and get completely all new models. There's no, like, real good way to say, like, well, I can grab these guys and use these. You know, like, you know, like in uh, Song of Blades and Heroes, just any fantasy guys you can sort of switch. But with these, they kind of need to be probably badgers and kind of need to be probably, I don't know, squirrels or whatever. The, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, I haven't really looked... I looked at, like, the fluff and stuff like that a little bit, and I haven't really looked at the... Um, the rule set to see like what that's like, but it's um, it's a very well produced book. Like I love the artwork and everything, and it looked it looked very cool that way. So yeah. Howie says if you consider buying a Detolf, you should definitely buy additional shelves. Yeah, I could see that. That makes sense because they are kind of far apart, and uh, since they're glass too, you know, um, they're not going to block too much like view or light too much. So you can buy if you buy additional shelves, then you can. Um, you know, our guys are small, so it's not that big of a deal. Sean says that they're a difficult a pain, actually, to put together. Um, let me see what else we got here. Howie says he got his shelves uh, for his Deltoff for cheap on eBay. Well, that's cool. Justin says, hey, Adam, I've got plans to build a 6x4 city for 40k, but I can't decide on modular or non-modular buildings. What kind of terrain would you recommend? Um, normally when I build stuff like that, I just have a lot of ruins, which are pretty modular to some degree. Um, yeah, generally for, for ruins, that's what I do. Because I don't usually get crazy with, um, like, I've seen some amazing looking boards that look almost, um, like a diorama. You know what I mean? Like a museum quality kind of thing. That, uh, guy, uh, Luke... Uh, Luke APS whatever uh, on, on on YouTube, he did a kill team thing a while ago. It was like a five or six part video, and and it looked amazing. I mean, it really did. The, just the board was astounding looking. But the whole time I'm looking at it, I'm thinking to myself, I would think my guys were gonna fall over on those piles of rubble. Like, how do I get guys to stand there? That kind of thing. And he worked a little bit in trying to smooth things out. I've seen worse ones where I'm like, there's no way that guys are gonna be able to stand on that. You know. But his was better that way. But it was also, there was like, you know, the buildings and all that stuff in that, if I remember correctly, don't go anywhere. Like, because they've got rubble piled all around them and all that kind of stuff. And so I like my stuff to be a little bit more modular. Now, it probably looks a little boring, you know, but I, you know, it, 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 that's where the, the, the trade comes from. Whether you're going to have stuff that's very modular, you can swap around and change things up quite a bit, but it's maybe a little bit more boring versus I've made this thing that looks almost like a diorama, but nothing moves. It's always, we're always fighting over the exact same, like, you know, three city blocks or whatever. So you've got those 
kind of considerations you have to take into consideration. John Jay says, I just used some straight LA Awesome. LA is totally awesome, actually, uh, from the dollar store. Uh, in the ultrasonic cleaner to strip some bones and whiz kids models. Worked amazingly in 24 minutes worth of sonic cleaning. Yeah, I, man, I tell you, that's that, that video, I'm surprised that the video, the ultrasonic cleaner video from years ago hasn't gotten more views because it really is the way to go. And, and the trick is, is that ultrasonic cleaners are so cheap now, like on eBay or Amazon, like 25 bucks, you can get yourself an ultrasonic cleaner. Like I have two, I have one for stripping models and I have another one just for my airbrush. It's in my airbrush room and it's what cleans my airbrush. Now my airbrush room sounds fancy, but it's actually just this weird little Harry Potter room underneath the basement stairs that I think used to be a coal bin. But nonetheless, um, yeah, it, it's just, it it's, it's very cool. I, I like it a lot and it really helps. So Kelly says, wow, Detolf cabinet is only $60 USD. Yeah, they're super cheap. I mean, for a hundred, like it's seriously, it's like 95 or a hundred pounds. It's a lot of glass, but it's pretty cheap. Um, let me see here. What else have we got? Gary McNally says, Luke's affordable paint surface. His stuff is amazing. Yeah, um, I he, he's a very good uh, uh, terrain guy and, and that kind of stuff. And he's got some cool tips for, um, for painting stuff too. Let me see here. What else have we got? Um, anyone else watching the Great Model Railway Challenge on Channel 5? It's like the Bake Off, but for modelers. That sounds like a BBC thing. Um, no, it's interesting, though. Uh, that, that would be kind of interesting. 521 Wallace says, Hi, Adam and chat. I have a problem where I don't like going to the local GW, but that's pretty much the only place to find a game. Any advice? Well, uh, I would tell you to take a look at um, uh, an app that I have helped design. I have, it's part of my day job, um, and it's called Game4, G-A-M-E-F-O-R. If You can find it on Android and iOS, and it has the ability to show you gaming events going on in your area. You can put in a looking for players um, thing. It's almost like a, not, I don't want to say it's like a, a, a classified ad because it starts to get weird. But it's just basically a thing where you post a thing saying, hey, I'm looking to play this game, this game, or this game. And then people can send you a message in the app, not to your email, not to your text. You know, it's, it's in the app. So you can block them if they're weird or whatever. We're very concerned about privacy and safety and all that kind of stuff with the app. Um, but we also have uh, groups and club support as well. And um, you can also find other stores in your area probably because we have a store finder list, which currently has over 6,400 stores worldwide. So... Um, uh, I know that sounds like an ad, but um, but it is it is part of my day job. I helped design it, and I think it's um, important for the gaming community to be able to find other people to play with. Whether it's not it's not just war gaming, it's also board gaming, um, role playing, uh, collectible card games, all that kind of stuff. So check it out. Um, we are actually in process right now. We're getting closer. Um, of releasing a beta version of the app that will be actually on the web. So if you don't have a smartphone or if you're at work and people will look at you weird if you're messing with your phone, but they don't look at you weird when you're messing with your computer, um, there will be a web version of Game 4 coming up at soon. Um, that's what I've been working on the last couple of weeks. So, yes. Um, let me see here. What else have we got? 12 Neef also says try the Game 4 app. There you go. See? David says, I'm just getting into sculpting. I hope to sculpt my own miniatures. Having a hard time with scale. Anyone know where I can get more information on scaling? Um, I don't know a ton about uh, sculpting, but I do know that what people do for scale a lot of times is they start with, and you may be already doing this, but they start with these pre-made, they're called, I think, armatures or something like that. And it's basically like a very thin kind of like skeleton, you know, like there's, and it's posable. It's made out of frequently like pewter or something like that. It's the same kind of material that like metal models are out of, but it's super skinny and it's like arms, legs and the whole thing. So you bend the model and get it in the position you want and then you sculpt around it. And the upside to that is then you know that you're very close at least because if you buy a 28 millimeter armature, then you can kind of guess what size it's going to be. Whereas if you bought like a 54 millimeter armature, then you would know. Um, yeah, that's what all I got. Um, Ryan Coleman says, drink. He mentioned game four again. Okay, that's cool. Um, 
What else have we got? Uh, Mystic Shroom. Mystics? Yeah, Mystic Shroom. Is there a way we can help make Game 4 better in our area? My local Game 4 is dead. Um, honestly, talking to the local stores in your area and telling them they can sign up for free and put their events in, um, that's a good way. Uh, early on, a lot of stores were like, yeah, but i got to put everything into Game 4, and then I still have to put my stuff into, let's say, Google Calendar or the website on my, you know, for my, for my store. Well, we've now added Google Calendar support and also like a if like a web widget a calendar. So if you've got if you're a store and you've got a a page on your um, website that's got like here's all the events, you can now just put a fully working calendar on that page that will pull your stuff from Game Four, and then people can see like the entire month and see all your events and click on one, and it pops up and it tells them the time and all this information and all that jazz. So you enter it once, and then you can use it both on your website and it'll also be in Game Four to other people to find. Or you, if you're using Google Calendar, you can export to Google Calendar, all that kind of jazz. So we're making it easier and easier for stores to get into that kind of stuff. Um, it just takes time. Like we've not even been doing this a year yet. We launched this like three days before Christmas. So our one year anniversary will be coming up um, at Christmas. And to be fair, we didn't really, other than me telling people here on the channel about it, we didn't do any kind of marketing or really spread the word until like March of 2018 this year. So, you know, yeah, we're still working on that, but it's, it's, it's getting there. Um, we've got 25,000 ish people signed up, you know, registered users now. And um, like I said, the game finders got like, I think I said it's 6,400 plus stores. Uh, groups and clubs, it's over a thousand groups and clubs now. So yeah, it's been working out well. Um, what else have we got here? Paul John Houghton says, I've created custom terrain pieces and started customizing them with spare banners, barrels, etc. to make ruined inns, towns halls, uh, to personalize the board. Yeah, like scattered terrain can really help to personalize a board sometimes too. If you've got like a very rigidly designed board that doesn't really lend itself to modularity, but then you can like, let's say it's sci-fi, you can have some like ruined car over here and then that'll help with cover or you can put up sandbags over here or barrels or crates and things like that. That type of stuff can help a lot. Um, Zebulon says, Game 4 is great for finding stores when traveling. I agree. Uh, let me see here. What else have we got? Okay, we're just going to quickly do, okay, and we're going to um, do that. Um, and we'll do that, and we'll do that. Okay. Okay, cool. <clears throat> what else have we got? Um, Epic Lizard says, I got in late. What app is this? It is Game 4, which is an app. Uh, here, I'll put on a website. Uh, HTTPS and colon slash slash www. I am Game4.com. There you go. Cool. All right. Um, Jonathan McLean says, I'd love to get some sci-fi scatter terrain for Kill Team. Don't have a 3D printer. Do you have a suggestion for small pieces? The stuff that I really like, there's two things. Okay, so Mantic makes a box of terrain that's designed more for sci-fi stuff. And I think it's called Terrain Crate. So if you look on Mantic's website, you, I think you can find it. Terrain Crate, I want to say is right. But um, another great place for um, good uh, scatter terrain, and it's whether it's fantasy or modern or sci-fi or whatever, is something called Tiny Terrain. And that's made and produced by Miniature Market. Miniature Market um, has an entire line of like resin terrain, and and they send out and they've got tons of like I said, tons of different types of pieces. Um, you you got to paint it. You got to paint most of the stuff, but it works out really nice for scattered terrain. They've got sandbags. They've got you know like computer panels that you can set up. They got all kinds of things. But there's lots of companies now that make that kind of stuff, especially for sci-fi. Um, but yeah, those are the ones I like. So. Let me see here. Dave White says, when will Kill Team be back in stock? Um, the big box, from what I understand, is going to be back in stock. I was just talking to someone at the local game store recently. Like sometime either this month, probably this month. It would be 
not great if it was December. It would be probably a lot better if it was this month with Christmas coming up and all that jazz, but it is supposed to be coming soon, yes. Uh, George says the local store had gotten a few boxes in last week. Well, there you go. Like, my local store, I don't know if they'd still do, but, like, I uh, my, like, very close local store had, like, because I had told them about it early, and I was like, you seriously want to make sure you order a bunch of this. So he still had several boxes, maybe three, last time I was in there, um, because he had gone heavy, but he's definitely trying to, like, grow the, the, like, he's starting to do a thing, I think, on Wednesday nights in our local store where people get together playing kill teams. So um, I'm hoping to go down and try that out. Um, it just depends on you know, when I'm doing the videos, so there's that. <clears throat> uh, Martin says you can make industrial pipes out of PVC pipes and connectors. Yeah, that's true. That, yeah, that's I mean that's kind of fun stuff to do too. Uh, let me see here. What else have we got? Um, how hard are resin models to work with for noobs? I've only been in the hobby eight months and wanting to pick up on the Sly Marvo, but don't want to ruin it. <sighs> yeah, it's a bummer that Sly is resin. I well, okay, so. There's different types of resin, um, so that's something to kind of be concerned about a little bit sometimes. Like some companies, their resin is really hard. Some of them, it's a little bit softer. Um, I don't know what Sly Marbo's resin is going to be like, but if I had to guess, I would say it's probably a little bit softer, but not too bad. Um, the main thing with resin, there's two main things with resin. Number one is you need to try to wash the model before you try to prime it or paint it. Um, the mold for resin is usually like a rubbery type mold and they have to spray something on the inside which is called mold release so that when they pour the resin in there it's kind of like um when you can't get your muffins out of the muffin pan you had to spray like the pam or whatever kind of stuff in there first so that it can you can pull the muffins out without tearing them apart it's the same type of thing it's like this spray that goes inside the um or it's a powder or something that goes inside the mold and then when they pop out the finished product that has to be able to release so um, you want to wash resin models just a little, just a, a like put a little bowl of water, like warm water, just a, just a tap, just a touch of um, like dishwashing soap or whatever, and um, scrub it with maybe a little toothbrush a little bit, you know, and then rinse it off under the sink and let it on a piece, set it, set it on a piece of paper towel to dry and let it air dry. Um, before you do any kind of priming or anything like that, before you even build it, honestly, I just on a sprue or whatever, just do it that way. So that's that's number one. Um, number two is when you are like trying to get rid of the mold lines, or if you're sanding or doing any kind of stuff like that. If you're doing just one model and you're not doing it right in front of your face, you're probably okay. If you're doing a bunch of resin, I would probably wear some sort of a thing some sort of respirator or a mask or wrap your head with a towel i don't know what the the dust especially from sanding uh the dust from resin can if you inhale it can evidently irritate your lungs so that's something to be concerned about too but really with resin those are the only two things you need to kind of get the mold release off because otherwise the paint will come off because it, it will be releasing from the, the model uh and you also want to make sure you don't inhale any of the dust for like when you're sanding on it specifically. Like if you're just cutting a piece, you probably don't need to. But if you're doing any kind of sanding, you know, then you definitely want to be wearing something because otherwise it'll get in there and your lungs will get itchy or something. And it's really hard to itch your lungs. So, or scratch your lungs. Anyway. Uh, Brian says that current GW resin releases are no longer fine cast. I know they're not called fine cast anymore. They're using better quality resin these days. I think it's not quite still uh, Forge World quality, but it, from what I understand, it is better quality. But they've not been doing a ton of it. Like they use it for like yeah, Sly Marbo. They're using it for I think Slambo uh, from uh, Age of Sigmar. Pretty sure I know he's resin, and I think he's more that kind of new stuff. But yeah, uh, the Buford asks, Hey Adam, any pro tips for a first time Adepticon attendee? Well, uh, I did a video years ago about if this is your first convention, then you should probably watch that video that I did about. Uh, attending conventions, things you need to bring, um, you know, that kind of stuff. That's a good idea. You know, deodorant, comfortable shoes, uh, stuff like that. As far as Adepticon specifically, um, if you are staying in the main convention center hotel, then um, that's 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 the that's really nice. 
Um, we generally bring snacks and food and stuff like that and then don't go out too much because we don't want to like leave and go other places. There's plenty of people that are like, well, we're going to go eat tonight at this place and we're going to, and whatever. And they'll get, you know, they'll either drive there or they'll Uber or I don't know, there might be shuttle buses and stuff like that. We generally hang out mostly there and we kind of, we bring sandwich stuff, you know, and granola bars and snacks. And, and there are some restaurants in there too, which are lovely, um, but they're not like cheap. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, bring yourself some stuff to drink, bring yourself some stuff to eat and snack on. Um, understand that there are things that you can get there too if you want to, um, but they're, you know, considerably, just like any convention, they're considerably more expensive than they would be at the grocery store. So, you know, plan ahead that way. Um, if you're staying elsewhere, you know, like uh, there's some places that are within walking distance and there are some places that are even further away, you know, that's fine too. If you're just showing up for a day to check it out, that's a great thing to do because it kind of helps. You can go in and buy stuff from the vendors and see what's going on and all that stuff if you're just making it a day trip. Um, Adepticon is great for a day trip because you can just, just kind of go on and look around. You don't even need, need to necessarily, like, if you want to play anything, then you need, like, a ticket, you know, or a badge or, uh, you know, whatever. But if you just want to go in and buy stuff from the vendors and look around and, and stuff like that, you don't need to go through all that, you know, registration and all that jazz, which is great. Um... Let's see. Adam Jackson says, wet your tools with working with resin. That's also a good idea. If you're using sanding and you wet it, um, then the dust doesn't fly, so it doesn't get into your lungs. So that's good. Um, let me see here. What else have we got? Um, Randall says, recently found a list of Adepticon 19 events. Lots of ice and fire stuff going on. Very little kill team, it seems. Um, I don't know that it's... 100% yet. Uh, the the event listing is going to be coming up. Like the, the finalized listing, I think, is coming soon. I just got an email about that. Because uh, it's not just for gaming events, but also hobby events. I'm going to be doing two seminars again there this year. Um, I'm talking about YouTubery. And um, so if you're going to be at Adepticon, look for those if you want to learn about you know YouTube and how to become a YouTuber or whatever. Um but yeah, that's 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 a good thing to look at. Excuse me, to look at. Uh, Matthew Sears says, "Buy your moderator a beer." Is the Adepticon rule of thumb? Yeah, indeed, this is the thumb, and that's the rule of it. So yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Randall says, "How do you feel about mixed drinks?" To Matthew Sears, oh, I know how he feels about mixed drinks. Um, that will probably be fine as well. Let me see. What else? Uh, Tyler Berry says, I am trying Xenothal highlights. I really don't see the benefit. What am I doing wrong? Well, so with Xenothal highlights, if those of you that don't know what we're talking about, um, let's say that this giant guy here was a model that is smaller. Okay. He's all white, which is why he looks like this. Anyway, Xenothal highlights is usually like I prime him all black and then I spray him from above with a lighter color, like a white or a light gray. And then what that does is it's, it okay, now this light source is coming from this side, so it doesn't make any sense. But in most situations, your light source is above, okay? So the light hitting the top of the head, top of the shoulder, top of the arm, you know, top of this arm, that kind of stuff, the light is coming from above, so you're faking it by adding lighter paint coming from above, and then the darker paint gets underneath in between the legs and underneath the backpack and underneath the underarm and all that kind of stuff. Now, you're saying, okay, great, so now I've got this black and white model that looks like it's being lit from above. That's cool, but now I'm going to try to paint it. Well, here's the deal. Some people use the Zenithal highlighting as a guide to, so they can see, okay, well, this is where I should transition from the lighter color flesh tone to the darker color flesh tone. That's cool, too. Some people will use a, thinned, a slightly thinned paint so that it even helps to kind of... Um, uh, I don't, I don't, exasperate's not the right word, accentuate <laughs> the, uh, the color situation. What I do a lot of times when I do Zenithal highlighting is then I don't use paints in a lot of those situations. I use glazes. So if I have, um, let's say this, this guy had a big cape and I sprayed it so it was white on the top and it faded to black down at the bottom, you know, that way with the Zenithal, then I use, let's say, a red glaze and now it looks like I have perfectly blended light red paint all the way down to almost black dark red paint and all I did was I just put on some glaze over the black and white fade that I already did now you know like flesh tones 
that's up to you on how you want to do that. Whether you want to have a real dark flesh tone that goes that way, then you might just use a, a thinned flesh tone paint. Um, metallics, you're probably not going to bother. Like when I do Zenithal highlighting, I prime it black, dust it white from above. Then I go through and do all the parts that I would use glazes on and take care of all that. Work on skin tones as well, some of that kind of stuff. And then like the sword or the shield or kind of junk like that, I usually paint those in metallics and then I just completely cover over everything as far as the Zenithal is concerned and then do my blending or whatever I'm going to be doing, you know, washes and stuff after that. But it, it kind of, everybody does it a little bit differently. Some people, like I said, just literally look at it and use it as a guide to know where they should try to make their transitions from like lighter to darker. I actually use it as a cheat. I spray the thing and then do that, and then I use washes, which are or not, washes or glazes, usually more glazes, because they're very transparent, and then they make that black and um, that that transition work out really well. So, uh, anyway, that's where that goes. Uh, Gun Toast says I'm putting steel bearings in my Army Painter paints right now. Don't know if they are stainless. What's the worst that can happen? Uh, rust, I assume. Probably bad. I don't know. I have no idea. I've never used that. Um, what else have we got here? I've heard a lot of people use... Someone was just talking recently. Was it last Was it last episode? Someone was talking about using hematite beads because they're heavier than glass, but they don't... Well, they don't rust or anything like that. It's That's something. Um, Grimlock Steve says, should I give up on Age of Sigmar? I've been playing for a year and I've never won. I don't mind losing. I only play for fun, but it's a bit annoying against playing against guys who just own you all the time. Uh, if you're having fun, I wouldn't say give up on it. I would say, uh, you know, just if you're having, if it's, if it's a fun game, then you're having fun. If, if you're not having fun, then, well, you know, that, that's kind of the, it, Again, I'm going to say it. I believe the games should be fun. So if you're playing a game and you're not having fun, well, then maybe that's not a game that you enjoy. Or maybe there's something else that's going to concern. I don't know. Um, maybe it's an army change that you need to take. Maybe it's you've been playing an army that's not the style that you like or, or something like that, and you want to tweak differently. It's totally. There's a lot of different options. Um, but if if the game if the if if it's all about winning which is kind of about what we talked about, in, or what I talked about at least, on Friday's video, and a lot of people commented about being that guy. You don't want to be that guy, but you know, if you're like, well, I, I enjoy playing, but I would like to win eventually. Well, there's also things you can do to help, like, strategize better and things like that, or whatever. There's, you know, it, it but it takes time. And it depends how many games you played in a year. Like, some people only play, like, you know, 10 games in a year because they can't play that frequently. Other people can play 100 games or 200 games in a year, depending on how, how much time they've got their group, all that kind of stuff. So it kind of totally depends. So yes. Uh, a bunch of people say using glass beads is also a good idea. Uh, three to five millimeter glass beads on eBay. Torches I used plastic beads, but they aren't heavy enough, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. I can see that. Um, What else here? I put steel BBs in acrylic paint pots over 20 years ago, which I still have today, and I've never had a discoloration problem for rust BBs. Well, that's good. Um... Hematite beads are awesome, weigh a lot, and look just like you're putting magic in your paints. Ooh, magic. That's fun. Um, all right, let's see here. So, uh, let's talk about... Uh, we, well, we're kind of talking on and off about terrain, but let me try to show you some cool pictures. Poke and... Pictures... That one. All right. And that. There we go. So, I was at... The heck was uh, Valhalla. I was at Valhalla in Utah in the earlier part of October, late part of September, earlier part of October. And one of the things that's really awesome about Valhalla, there's a bunch of things that are awesome about Valhalla, but one of the things that's most awesome about Valhalla is the terrain. They bring in some amazing terrain for the tables, and you can play on any of the tables you want 24 hours a day the entire time you're there, and it's great. So I, at one point, one afternoon uh, when there wasn't a lot of people playing on, on some of the tables, I went through and took a bunch of close-up pictures of them because I like to take pictures for inspiration. I like to take pictures and say, when I start building some terrain from scratch, I want to do it like this. Or I find a paint thing that I'm like, this paint is amazing. Like, because this stuff you see right now here in the frame over there. Nope, there. That stuff um, is, uh, that's normal GW 
you know, Mechanicum or whatever the heck it is called. But the paint techniques I thought were super cool, so I took some pictures of that. Again, for inspiration, but you're going to see some other stuff here too that is also just amazing looking stuff. Those are my Death Guard for Kill Team. This picture is not particularly great exposed. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can see there's like in the background over there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a, what do you call that, a patina, verdigris, that kind of thing, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, this was the big setup, not that big because it's Kill Team, but this is the setup that they had for Kill Team. It was uh, on a normal Kill Team 22 by 30 mat, and it's a lot of that Mechanicum or whatever stuff. Um, a lot, it's, it's the stuff that they released when Shadow War Armageddon came out, and uh, they keep making it now, and they had a really nice setup um, with it. And uh, yeah, but it just like, like the stripes over here on this stuff was astounding, and like the rust work on everything. Um, I think it was a lot of um, uh, the, um, what do you call it, the hairspray technique. If you go back and look at um, the playlist of Painting with the Pro, the videos that uh, Sam did, he did the hairspray technique a while back and showed kind of like how that worked on like some sort of bunker wall or something like that. Oh, fire department. All right. Um, now, this stuff is custom made. Uh and this, the reason I took this picture is because I love the embellishments and the uh, attention to detail in terrain. A lot of people, when they start building terrain, they immediately start with, well, I'm going to make like, you know, like the, the standard, um, what do you call it, foam core, like ruined building corner. You know, and you cut out your shapes and you put it together in you know, a 90 degree angle and you do all that stuff and you throw some rubble around and that's great. But a lot of times it's just a flat wall with some windows cut in it and a second floor that's kind of broken and then you paint it and you, you go on your way. But when you look at this, I mean, like, this is like an electrical junction box down here and then there's like a wire that runs up and you can even see that the wire runs up to this point and then, I don't know if you can see it very well, but it like is bent at 90 degree angles to go around this kind of edge work on the building. I mean, like if you see, if you ever go, like, or if you ever see like electrical conduit when they run those pipes and they bend them in the right, it, like it's the same type of thing. Like this is an astounding amount of detail. I don't know where these pieces come from. I don't know if they are custom creating them and then making molds so they can crank out bunches of them or what they're doing, but this was all custom made terrain. It's amazing looking stuff, but it's these types of little, you know, like this is like maybe an air conditioner unit or something like that. Down here, there's a power box and the power box is rusty and a bunch of the paints come off. I mean, it's astounding looking stuff. Like here's a close up, and they've even got like a little poster, you know, that's got some sort of Imperial Eagle thing going on and you can see the little handle on the door and all that stuff. Just astounding, amazing stuff. And this is the type of stuff that that I, I think inspires me when I'm trying to build my own terrain, not store-bought stuff generally, but stuff where I'm trying to build it and go, but where do I, how can I make this little thing? How can I make this look more real, make it look more interesting that way? Um, this was another building that was, I mean, just astounding in my opinion. Um, it, it, this is, again, all custom-built and... Like, I don't, again, I'm thinking that probably like these windows here, this is probably a shape that they made one of, molded it, you know, in resin or something like that, or maybe dental plaster, and then they can crank out a bunch of these windows. Because just cutting a hole in the wall, if you look at any window in your house or your apartment or any building you're at, it's rarely just a flat hole in a wall with glass in it. There's normally like a window sill and there's like a molding around it and stuff like that. And we don't frequently take the time to make our buildings look like that. And so they don't look as real as they could or as interesting as they could. I mean, you've got down here, you've got some sort of like, this is probably like a locking mechanism for this door. This door is shuttered and closed. You know, you've got, I don't know, this could be a thing like a garbage can or whatever. Um, like the sign is cool. There's rust effects and like leakiness on the sign and everything little pieces of gravel and junk and stuff like that. I will bet you that a lot of that is probably kitty litter down there that was glued down before they painted. Um, cracks in the sidewalk, all that kind of stuff. This is just, I mean, it takes a long time. It's just not a quickie, throw it together, you know, um, overnight kind of project, but it also looks amazing when you're done. And the trick is, is that when you're building terrain for yourself, for your house, you don't have to make a ton, you know what I mean? Like, you don't have to make a... Like, if you're doing this quality for, like, a convention as big as, say, like, Adepticon or Nova or LVO, this would be 
problematic to make 50 or 60 or 100 tables or whatever of this quality stuff, obviously. But when you're doing it for yourself and you're enjoying it, um, I find that like flipping back and forth between terrain and models helps me also with motivation because there's times when you're like, oh, I'm tired of painting like little tiny you know, backpacks and, 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 and uh, bolters and whatever. And then you switch over to a building for a while and you do that and then you come back to your you know um, other stuff. So that's fun. Um, again, here's some close-ups of these awesome looking uh, uh, window embellishments. I don't know, window sills, kind of sci-fi, crazy window sills. I get the feeling that probably maybe some of this, at least initially, is maybe 3D printed, but it might not be. They might have just completely hand sculpted it and then made, like I said, molds from that. Here's kind of like some of you can see some of the stuff going on for the roof, you know, and like the the light that would go, that would shine down onto the um, billboard or whatever, and all that kind of jazz. Um, here's stuff on the roof. Like people don't think a lot of times about, well, yeah, but there's... You built this building, but isn't there like an air conditioning unit or something up there, or solar panels, or or anything? You know, venting something. There should be something. If your building's just got a flat roof, that doesn't you don't see that. No house, pretty much, almost ever, has got just a roof with nothing on it. There's at least a smokestack or something. So, kind of taking that into consideration, thinking about those things, I think, is really what helps make these pieces look astounding. Um, this is like some sort of crazy, like a fire hydrant, maybe up on the front. The fact that the, this building has got a round corner to it, which I think is amazing. And these windows and just all these little greeblies. Like when you, greeblies is like a technical term for like when you're looking at like the Death Star in, uh, or, a, or Star Destroyer or the Millennium Falcon, something like that in the Star Wars. And there's all that junk stuck all over the outside that looks, it just makes it look kind of sci-fi. But if you look at like an actual real, let's say fighter craft, you look at like an F-22, they're pretty smooth on the outside. They don't have all kinds of weird ridges. I mean, you've got panel lines and you've got maybe um, wind speed indicator or, you know, sensors and some stuff like that here and there. But the trick is, is that it needs to be kind of smooth. Now, this is a building, so we don't have to worry about aerodynamic. But like, like, what's the point of some of these things? Like, why are these eight dots here? I don't know. Maybe it's something, maybe it's not, but it just makes it look kind of cooler and a little bit more interesting. There is the the rule of cool, and then there's the trade-off for like, but is it realistic? You know, and, and I think that that's important to kind of look at as well. But um, like this door here, uh, you know, if this was like a garage door style door, but it was also curved like this, I don't think that would work because it wouldn't be a rolling door. If it just went straight up, I guess that could work as a round. But, but just, you know, things like that. But it looks awesome. So that's kind of part of it. Again, we've got more uh, pieces. Like this is obviously like a vent. And I guess this could be a vent. Uh, I don't know what some of these other things are other than they just look cool. Again, you know. Uh, we've got a ladder. Ladders are always important. Again, more venting. Some sort of electrical connector box. And you, again, you can see how the wires and all that stuff went up to the sign and everything. Like things, when you look at the outside of any kind of normal house, there's always like a box on the outside of the house. And then there's like some sort of conduit going somewhere. Uh, maybe it goes to a spot and then goes into the house, or maybe it goes down to the ground and you know, whatever. But it, there's usually, you know, there's usually not just a, a box on the side of the building. You know what I mean? There's normally conduit going somewhere. This is a shot of a different angle of that same building, and it's crooked. Anyway, um, like I don't know what that is. It's cool looking though, but it's just an added, another added little piece that goes on to um, you know making this stuff look really, I think, cool. This part blew me away because I'm assuming this was done after it was predominantly all painted. They just then strung a bunch of like wires. Like you've probably seen pictures of uh, like, I don't know, like maybe places in India, you know, or in South America or Central America, places like that where it's like cities that have gotten humongous very quickly. And then people have just like strung wires to power or whatever. And they're, you know, they didn't really, there's not a lot of, I don't know, OSHA regulations or whatever, this is like not safe looking, but it makes sense. Like this is the opposite of running a decent conduit. You know what I mean? Just We'll just hang this off and it'll just wiggle back and forth in the breeze. But it gives uh, a definite kind of sense of place to this stuff. I think it makes it look really amazing and it's just another detail. And it's not super difficult probably to do. To get that curve to be as smooth as it is, that might be a little bit harder with like normal wire because otherwise, you know, you'd have to really smooth it. But once you do it once, if the way it's 
designed, it's not going to probably catch on things when you're transporting or putting away this terrain too much because this sign is sticking out so far that hopefully this is kind of more protected, you know, and not going to catch on stuff. But, you know, it depends on how tightly you pack your terrain shelves or whatever, that kind of thing. Again, another cool sign, a very interesting kind of roof. Um, it's simple. I mean, it's just probably pieces of like thin plastic card that you can buy like at the hobby store. So you've got a piece of maybe cardboard or plastic card, and then you just run some of this stuff and just cut it, cut it, cut it, glue it down, easy. But it makes it look so much better. And then when you paint it, you know you kind of differentiate and go that direction, and it just looks really nice. You can tell that they used some sort of, probably if I had to guess, I would say spackle or whatever you guys call it overseas. Um, it's the stuff you use to patch holes like in your walls from like picture frames and things like that. And it looks like they probably because. I'm pretty sure that a lot of these structures were built with foam core and then instead of just using the flat foam core, they then put a thin layer of spackle over it to make it look more textured than foam core because foam core can be pretty smooth and sort of shiny. You know, I know that like this stuff all along here, this concrete, um, you know, a lot of that stuff is also, again, covered in some sort of spackle or whatever. You got these little, you've even got the little, like this is the lunch counter for the quantum noodles place and you've got the little... Um, benches you know so you can sit here and eat your noodles at the window i think that's a really cool uh thing and over here you've got your light pole you can see a bunch of the wires hanging down to the street light and everything over here there's a spool of wire just hanging off of the side of the building there um again there's that spool hanging off the side of the building little connectors and all kinds of stuff it, you know when you make it look like it was actually put together by little tiny people then it just i think it's more um immersive this is again another shot of that Here's another cool, you know, window. Now this one's different than the other ones, but it's again, it's not like that's the thing is that if you want your windows to match, then if you make like one window shape, and if you do have the ability to either three D print it or have a friend three D print a bunch of them, or if you can make a mold and then cast a bunch of them, whether it's resin or whatever, you can crank out really super high end stuff. Now, admittedly, I'm not saying to everybody here, let's be perfectly honest, that this is the only way you should make your terrain. I'm just saying if you want your terrain to be absolutely jaw dropping then this is the things you have to consider. You can take bits and pieces of this, like you could go back to this here, like just these little strips, like I said, you can buy this stuff at like your hobby store very frequently and just making your roof look a little bit cooler would be something, you know, for a piece of terrain you're building. You don't have to hang all these wires and put in all your other stuff and cast your own windows, but even just doing a little bit of like maybe some of this wire work and maybe the cool looking roof thing with the strips, that kind of stuff really can make it look cool. Um, this, I'm wondering if this is a Pringles can. So like this building has got like this cool kind of like, you know, the roof is, is slanted in the back, this part's straight, but then it has this round tower in the middle. And then it says pod rentals there. And uh, I don't know, I just think it looks really neat. It's just very interesting to kind of see. I know that this was a situation where they had to sit down and like kind of probably sketch a lot before they got to the point of doing, um, you know, the actual construction, even the pre-construction. This is more of a, a picture from below. Um, I don't know what this is. This is some sort of saving part, you know, parts and bits and things like that from other projects and even from like weird electronic stuff that you find can help a lot. I've, I've got a drawer full of weird junk that I've saved, little plastic crap that I'm going to eventually stick on or I've already stuck on different pieces of terrain. Um, like just these little details here, though. Are really interesting like they could have just made this a flat curved piece but then they cut this stuff into it and not only did they cut the stuff into it but there's another layer underneath it i mean that's going above and beyond and and difficult but that's why this stuff is really pretty amazing this is the inside of one of the buildings you've got some sort of poster over here you've got some probably you know crates that they got from somewhere like you know um this stuff up here this like railing this could be from like scale modeling could be from like you know like train set kind of junk but i don't know it could be 3d printed it's hard to say it's it's cool looking though and then these windows this is a cool trick um when you get when you buy a model that's in a blister pack i always save the blister pack plastic not all of them but like if it's thicker stuff sometimes i will save it and then i think there's another picture here yeah so you save that blister pack plastic and then what you do is you use it for windows and you just use an exacto blade and maybe a drill to like poke a hole in it and then just draw like the, the cracked lines and stuff like that in the blister plastic and then and sometimes you can even if you're what another thing you can do is when you glue it in make sure to use ca glue you know like super glue 
because they always tell you don't use CA glue when you're doing like a canopy on a built on a uh, like on a, a plane or a, or a fighter craft or anything like that. Anything clear, if you use CA glue, the vapor of the CA glue as it um, dries will fog the, the 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 clear plastic. Well, the only thing I would have done here that's a little bit more than what they did here is, and you can't see me pointing, but it's over here. Where anyway. Um, the only thing I would have done was I would have used CA glue because it would have helped to fog and kind of made the glass look grungier. Um, like this is a lot more clear, but then, you know, I guess it helps for seeing the cracks and all that kind of stuff, but it's a cool tip. And again, it's just the normal, like the plastic, like blister plaque, anything, you know, like these things, you know, this stuff, you just save this plastic and then use that um, for your windows and broken windows and things like that. It's really easy. Um, these are little tiny pallets, obviously, here at Warehouse 76. Um, I don't know where you would... I mean, I know that there's some uh, uh, companies like... I know um, Death Ray Designs makes little tiny, like, laser-cut MDF pallets you could use for those situations. And there's another company that does too, but I can't think of their name. But I've got Death Ray Design pallets, and they're, they're, they're nice. They're very nice. I mean, they're a little fiddly to put together, like any kind of tiny little pallet. But once you get, like, three or four of them built, they make great pieces, and you just glue them down. Um, or if you could even maybe sometimes use them kind of as scatter terrain, maybe, but yeah. Here you got like a little bird embellishment, which is not necessarily an Imperial Eagle. Um, but then these pieces on the corners, you know, to kind of, to, to trying to sometimes hide the parts where the two pieces of like, say, foam core come together with some sort of thing along the edges, that can also help a lot too. Got some windows here that have been um, boarded up. You can just use pieces of actual like wood, like um, coffee stirs and stuff like that. Um, but if the if you want to really over accentuate the grain, what I've done in the past in that situation is used a ballpoint, a ballpoint pen, and drawn the grain in. And then when you spray over it with primer and then well and wash and all that stuff, then you see the grain a lot more because you've actually poked fake grain kind of into it, following the real grain of the wood. You know, because it's a coffee stirrer that's made out of wood. This is a top-down shot of one of the buildings, and you can see how the building's not completely rectangular. It's got one corner that's curved, and then when you look at the roof, you can see that the roof has got a curve going the opposite direction. Well, not opposite, but it's not like one's going this way, the other one's going that way. Which I thought, you know, when you look at it, you don't notice it. When you look at it from top down, you're like, geez. I mean, that's. I, I just thought it was a really cool thing. And then this is that round one where I was like, I don't know if that's a Pringles can or not, but it's something. And then so you've got this round shape, and then the, this is the roof I was showing you before with the little strat, and that's, so that's at a slant. Just going with straight rectangular buildings, especially for sci-fi type of stuff, looks, I think it, it, it you, can, you can be selling yourself short when you're doing sci-fi stuff, so. Uh, here's another kind of shot of the, like you got your pod rentals and your easy fix there. Again, just, I think, amazing looking stuff. And then this is, for some reason, this is the last picture. Um, but this was a close-up of the first picture. I don't know how it ended up here at the end. Um, but again, this is some of the rust kind of effects that they were able to do on the, um, whatever that's Sector Mechanicus or whatever it's called, stuff from GW. This is that plasma doohickey. Uh, I've got one of these down in the basement. I've primed it. I haven't painted it fully yet. But uh, there's two of them that come in the kit, and they're built and primed. I primed mine like on a red oxide. And I'm going to put a lot of washes on it. But I'm going to definitely do the blue thing here like this with, um, you know, airbrush and all that stuff to make it look like it's glowing. And it's going to look cool. So, yeah. Um, I, I don't think I'm going to get quite this crazy rusty. I'm going to have my stuff be rusty but not this rusty. I Like when I do mine like this, I'm going to probably go more sponge rust as opposed to full-on salt and, and hairspray rust. But, yeah, we'll see. All right. I'm going to go back to this thing now and see how much chat has gone by and I bet you it's been some um, I also need to do that thing and do this all right so that's the type of stuff that I'm talking about with terrain I really like I, like that stuff was amazing and it was really fun to play on while I was there at, um, at Valhalla some of that terrain was also at Nova um, the Nova open um, because the guy who has that terrain his name is Chris, and he lives in the D.C. area. So it's way easier for him to take it to the Nova Open than it is for him to get it in a truck and drive it across the country to Utah. But he does take the stuff to Utah, and it makes it look amazing. So um, definitely, yeah. 
Uh, Phil Morris says that TT Combat has MDF palettes. I think a lot of companies have got MDF palettes, so there's a lot of different options out there for you. Uh, the MDF palettes just, I mean, I don't know that they would use wood palettes in the, in the 41st millennium, you know what I mean? So it depends. Like if you're playing a game like maybe like Wreckage, definitely, Infinity, um, something more modern, you know, or, you know, like less historical, but more modern, or even some kind of, like, you know, Batman, like the Batman game, I'm sure you would work out well that way. But I don't know if they would make a lot of sense in 40K. I wouldn't think they would, well, I don't, I don't even know, would they even have wood? <laughs> Back, I don't, well, yeah, I suppose there's plenty of agricultural planets and everything, but yeah, definitely. So, um, Flying Space Shop says, currently sitting in gaming shop while watching. Well, that's cool. Um, Gareth says, I remember Pringle cans being in seemingly every other white dwarf. Huts, fuel tanks, towers. What can't you do with them? Yeah, no, I mean, that's... I mean, it's... Because it's not as narrow as, like, a paper towel tube or a toilet tube. So if you want to use them... There used to be a lot of, in dark uh, in uh, White Dwarf back in the day, there used to be a lot of, like, hey, you should use these um, things you have around the house to make terrain for the models that we sell. And now they don't do that as much because they're like, hey, you should just buy these terrain kits for the models that you've already bought. And um, it makes sense. I get it. But, um, yeah. Torch says, semi-pro tip, use name brand foam core and not the cheap dollar store stuff for these projects. The paper comes off the cheap stuff and it bends too easily. Yeah, I could see that. Um... There are better versus worse types of, of foam core, yeah. Like the really cheap dollar store stuff is really cheap because it's not made well. So there's that. Um, but yeah. Keegan West, how about fantasy terrain? Any trips, ticks, uh, tips, tricks, cheap solutions, or ways to make it look really nice? I see a lot of people, um, and there's several different Facebook groups on YouTube. No. <laughs> several different Facebook groups on Facebook. Uh and some of them are run, I think, by YouTubers who make, they have channels about making terrain for, not for Wargaming, but for Dungeons & Dragons. The Tabletop Crafters Guild is a name that might be right, but I could be wrong. Um, and um, and they do a lot of, like, use, like, the pink foam, like the pink insulation foam, and then to make it look like, uh, and it's time-consuming, but to make it look like cobblestones or rocks or whatever, they, again, use a ballpoint pen and then just draw the rocks and the you know the, the brickwork or whatever and then when you, you you then when you paint over it to prime it and you don't usually use regular primer on foam whether it's pink foam white foam blue foam green foam any of those kind of foams because the propellant will eat the foam which is bad so um, a lot of times what people will do is they will sometimes even just use like a latex house paint that you can get real cheap at like the hardware store and use that to cover the first layer and then if you want to do spray can after that to make it gray or to give it some texture or whatever you can do that but the first layer should generally never be most rattle cans because the propellant will eat the foam which is bad so yeah um gareth also says when you're painting rusty stuff a few clean metal bits can really add contrast yeah normally when i'm doing rust effects on something like a vehicle or whatever i like to start with a real dark brown and i do my sponge rust and i do all that and then I go back with some orange, and I do less of it, and that's like the more recent rust, whereas the dark dark brown rust is old rust. And then I'll even go back with a little bit of silver and just do a little bit of edge highlighting here and there, like this. Like this has recently had the paint rubbed off, or even sometimes the rust rubbed off by something, and so it's still silver and it hasn't gotten rusty yet. Um, I, I do that quite a bit too. VJ Morph says that White Dwarf needs more deodorant bottle grav tanks. Yeah, like that's back in the day before that there were land speeders. They used to, there was an article where they showed you how to take like a bottle or not a bottle, like a speed stick, like underarm deodorant thing. And after you were done with it, they showed you how to turn it into a land speeder, basically. Kind of a grav tank sort of a deal. And uh, that was kind of one of their famous ones. And it was cool looking, you know, but it was obviously, a you know, it was obviously underarm deodorant. And it smelled like underarm deodorant probably um yeah so i do like those types of things and i've still got an old um how to make tabletop wargaming terrain book from gw that used to have tons and tons of stuff like that nowadays they're like and the thing is is that it's not like they're like doing this it's not, i don't think it's that they're doing it because they're like well it's just i don't think they're doing it as a i mean obviously they're doing it to make money 
But I don't think they're doing it like, well, we'll just make terrain kits so people stop building their own stuff. I think it's more of a situation of a lot of people are like, I would build my own stuff, but I would be much happier if I could just build a kit, you know, and you can show me how to do it. And it had more detail and all that kind of stuff. Because let's be perfectly honest, putting together like the stuff that came in the um, the um, the Shadow War Armageddon, I want to say Star Wars Armageddon, the, Sh the Shadow War Armageddon box that it Sector Mechanicus or whatever the hell it's called, putting that stuff together is way easier than trying to build anything even close to it from scratch. So, you know, these buildings that I was just showing you are amazing looking and they would be amazing kits if you could buy them, but they were all built from scratch for the most part and that's a lot of work. And so, you know, you're, you're, when you want it to look exactly the way you want it, then you want to go custom. But when you want it to be something quick and, and not too hard to do, then you end up buying a kit. Um, that's just the way that the terrain seems to go. And if you don't have the money to buy the kits, then you can build your own custom terrain for a good deal cheaper. But understand it's going to take longer. That's just the way that that stuff goes. Garrett says, I've seen that the green stuff uh, world rollers... A green stuff world <laughs> rollers i've got a couple of the rollers uh works really well on foam really i should try that out that would be interesting because i always thought it was more for green stuff hence the name of the company and all um and i like i've used the green stuff world rollers on bases but i've never used it on foam i should just take that and try it out hmm. black magic craft here on youtube is awesome for fantasy that's one that i recognize the name of um yeah Alexander Hader says, I actually have that copy of White Dwarf somewhere, the one that shows you how to make a land speeder out of a deodorant. Uh, that's that's cool. Marcos asks, how do you feel about MDF terrain and GW Orc terrain? I don't know if I've seen much GW Orc terrain. I know there's the new like workbenchy thing that they're releasing, uh, but I haven't seen much else of the GW Orc terrain that I can think of. MDF terrain is a little hit or miss. Some companies do amazing work and other ones slightly less so. Um, but it is a, astounding how many different companies are out there making it now and how many, like, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's way easier than it used to be to start your own little mini manufacturing company with, uh, you know, potentially five to $10,000 laser cutter or whatever. But to be able to do that and to be able to sell online and ship stuff out and do all that stuff, like you couldn't have done that 15, 20 years ago. So the fact that there's so many different laser cut MDF terrain solutions out there to choose from is awesome. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I Like I said, there's some that I look at and I go, eh, and there's other ones that I'm like, I really like that. Um, I'm going to say probably right now, like one of the most amazing things I've seen recently was, and I can't think of the name of it. It's made by Deathray Designs and it's like normal, like modern day kind of building ruins. Um, that when you put them all together, there's like a good amount of that same kind of embellishment that I'm talking about. Like there's like window sills and there's like, I mean, obviously there's not all that extra wire and all that junk. You could add stuff to that if you wanted to. It's a good base to start from. I can't think of the line, um, but that stuff works. That stuff looks really, really good. I mean, it does not look, when you're done, it doesn't really look MDF too. There's a lot of companies that make their laser cut MDF that even if you painted it and all that stuff, it still looks like MDF because it's super boxy or it's very two-dimensional, like on the sides. Um, or it's like you can obviously see that this tab goes into this kind of slot or whatever the deal is. And you're like, well, okay. Um, but yeah, I think that there's definitely some companies out there that are doing some amazing work with that stuff. Um, Brian says, I love sh scratch built stuff, but I think in general, tabletops have gotten way prettier since GW started putting out good ter terrain kits. Oh, absolutely. And a bunch of other companies, not just GW too. I mean, Mantix, their uh, battlegrounds or battle systems or whatever those cool modular boxes are that they kind of started with um, Dead Zone and then, you know, start, started just selling the kits separately. That stuff is amazing looking, I think. Um, like, it looks very boxy and cubey, but it also works really well. Like when I when I painted up the stuff that I did for Dead Zone, I made it look, I used a lot of the colors. I don't know if you ever have to sit and wait for the train, like when you're trying to get across town. I do a lot because evidently we live on the wrong side of the tracks. But when you're doing that, they have all these shipping containers going by on the train and they're all this sort of like, kind of like sun bleached. Like sometimes they're like an orange or a green or a blue or whatever. 
And there's like shipping containers have this sort of kind of color to them a lot of times. And they've also been sitting out in the sun a lot, so they're not real bright. It's a bit of a muted color. I did all my um, terrain for Dead Zone in those same types of colors because I wanted it to look like... Like the way that when I was reading the fluff is that they'd come to these planets and then they would take the ships apart to build the stuff that they had, which kind of explained why it was kind of modular and the fact that it was like, these are the shipping containers that all the colonization stuff came in. And so we just took the shipping containers apart and started to build buildings out of them. And that was the plan. So that's why they're very modular looking. Um, it, it totally depends, you know, on whatever kind of weird storyline you want to put into whatever type of game you're playing. You know, like obviously with, with like say 40K, there's already a storyline. And so everything's got a very gothic thing going on and there's a lot of skulls all over stuff and everything. And there's reasons for all of that. But in other types of games, you know, you, uh, you know, um, the fluff behind uh, Infinity has got its own kind of story to it, and everything's got a, a more of a, for lack of a better term, kind of an anime sort of aesthetic to it. So in my mind, like those buildings I was showing you, a lot of those like the quantum noodles and all that kind of stuff, like that stuff would work perfectly for um, for Infinity, um, as far as thematically is concerned, you know. Timber says, GW needs more Xenos terrain kits. I want some more Dark Eldar themed stuff. The Eldari stuff is okay for what little there is, but I feel that the Dark Eldar would have their own architectural design. It, they probably would, and it would probably be covered in spikes, if I had to guess. Um, and there would be people stuck on those spikes, probably, more often than not. Um, yeah, I mean, they do have, like, you know, there was a whole line of kind of Tau terrain that came out a while back. I don't know if it was just a splash release or uh, if they still make it. I'm not sure. But it was very Tau looking and it made some sense, definitely. And then there's been, you know, yeah, you're right. There's been a little bit of Eldar stuff, but not a ton. Um, I'm just kind of surprised. Yeah, I, I can't think of there being a lot of orc kits. I wish they would make, like, orc buildings a little bit more. But Lord knows there's plenty of, like, MDF laser cut companies that do orc buildings. So you could, you know, you're fine there um, if you need to be. But, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it, it is interesting. I mean, well, I was going to say you could even use, like, some, like, Star Wars... Um, the hex head game star wars legion type stuff for orc buildings but you'd have to you'd have to orc them up a lot you know what i mean they look very star warsy they look very tatooine if you see some of those buildings out there made by different companies you'd have to stick a bunch of crap to them to make them look real orky but you can do it uh iris and nova play says weird has some really cool looking malifo stuff coming out for and just released yeah they've got some really cool plastic buildings and they have that same sort of modular thing that I was talking about earlier in the show, like the stuff from Weta where you could take the second floor off and put it on this building and then take that building second floor and put it on that building and then swap the roofs and all that kind of stuff. It's the same thing with those these new plastic kits coming from Weird. Um, the buildings are very modular that way. Like they're all roughly kind of the same size. Not all of them, but most a lot of them are. And so you can swap stuff back and forth between them and they look cool. I picked up a couple at... Origins when I was at Origins in Columbus and I haven't built them yet but I do want to use them because the thing is is that again like I was saying before about Malifaux because the architectural blending of all the different cultures is very different it's not that hard to just use whatever you want but the upside is that I could use those buildings probably in Age of Sigmar if I wanted to I wouldn't use them in 40k I wouldn't use them in Wreckage I wouldn't use them in in, in a bunch of different games, but I could see using them in some more fantasy stuff, potentially. Um, yeah. I also bought, um, from GW, they make a set of, um, I think it's called The Houses at Lake Town, and it's from um, Lord of the Rings, or from The Hobbit. And so uh, I bought a set of those houses, and they're very, like, they're... They're fantasy, obviously, but they're not like crazy over the top fantasy, like a lot of the houses they used to make for old Warhammer fantasy. And um, so they would work in almost even just straight up medieval type settings if you wanted to play something that was like, if you, if you wanted to use them in Saga, you know, which is like straight up kind of Dark Ages or medieval or whatever you want to call it, they would work okay in that because they aren't covered in weird skulls or symbols or anything like that. They're just little houses kind of like on a dock, you know what I mean? And so they could work out well for that. But they're very nicely made, very nicely built, very detailed, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, let's see here. TT Combat, according to Earthman Brick, recently made a bunch of orc buildings last month. I'll have to take a look at that. That's kind of cool. 
Antonio says, building my own orc terrain out of cardboard and spackle and plastic card. Yeah. Honestly, anything that you kind of throw together already just looks a little orky right off the bat. You know, you, there's little things you got to do. You got to put the little glyphs in there, make the little kind of weird cut out orc face out of like cardboard and stick it in certain spots, make signs, misspell a bunch of stuff, that kind of jazz. But generally, if it looks kind of like it was thrown together, that's pretty much orc right there, you know, hands down. So, um, Uh, Diaz52 says Orc terrain is good for beginners as it lends itself to shoddy uneven construction yep exactly that's exactly the case um, Dylan says very spiked terrain the Drukari would have could even be like the catacombs of the hum homunculi and mandrakes inhabit would be a cool board yeah that would be pretty cool uh, what else have we got VJ Morph says the impudent mortal orc stuff is great as it comes with printed stick on art so you don't have to paint it only problem is impudent, impudent mortal have had to scrap a lot of their designs. Hmm. I would uh, scrap them because of copyright issues or of other reasons. Maybe manufacturing. That's interesting. Um, oh, because they can't get the right thickness of MDF anymore. Well, that's interesting. Huh. That's weird. Um, Torch says, I work so I can afford hobby stuff, but I don't have time to hobby. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that is the... Um, that is the dichotomy. Uh, that is the problem. Is that when you, you know, when you work more and you make more money, and then you don't have the time to do the stuff that you want to do with the things that you bought, like hobby stuff and whatever. Yeah, definitely. Um, do, 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 do. Corvus Games Terrain says, "Hey, Uncle Adam, any chance you can post your postal address for sending you swag?" Oh, I can't find the previous video where you posted it. Uh, yes, there. Um, let me do that. Uh, yeah, Tabletop Minions. It's at uh, 2080 West 9th Avenue, number 331, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, 54904. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, just recently I picked up, uh, I got a package from the, the, the Geek Room, uh, which is a new store in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, I had talked with the person who started it, Jason, when we, we talked at the... Uh, uh, tabletop Minions Meetup at Adepticon, and so he sent me some. Uh, he sent me a T-shirt, and he sent me some popcorn, like K H O R N E, and, uh, and it was pretty tasty actually. Um, so yeah, but anyway, yeah, if you want to send some stuff, I gotta put a shadow. I keep talking about how I'm gonna do it, and I just always forget. But yeah, um, Tabletop Minions, 2080 West 9th Avenue, number 331, Oshkosh, Wisconsin 54904. So you could do that. Um, yes, poke. There we go. What else have we got? Age of Sigmar needs more inspiring terrain. I, re I recently backed the super characteristic Hagglethorn Hollow terrain. Oh, we were just talking about Hag Hagglethorn Hollow. Um, I have to. I guess I have to. I didn't realize that the Kickstarter had started. I'll have to take a look at that. Um, when I originally watched the video about that stuff, as I was saying earlier, they said they were going to three D scan all of the stuff, and then they were just going to sell the three D printer files. And then a bunch of people were like, no, they decided not to do that. Instead, they're going to sell these pretty expensive pieces. So I thought, hmm, because I would prefer, frankly, to 3D print it myself. But um, anyway, so yeah, that's uh, I'll have to take a look at, at that. Uh, and then I forgot what the name of it was because I was just thinking what a workshops. But anyway, yeah, I'll definitely take a look at it. Um, David Turner says, thinking I'm going to buy the GameMat.eu industrial set. Quite expensive, but I find it difficult to get the time to build and paint terrain. I've seen that stuff, and it is painted. I mean, it's it's painted. It, it's not, like, super detailed painted, but it's a good place to start. If you did want to go in and make it look rusty, you could sponge paint rust on it or and just do some edge highlighting or some even some dry brushing or whatever to kind of just add a little bit, um, and that would work out fine. Or if you want to freehand some stuff, like maybe stripey, uh, you know, like caution lines or whatever, you know, stripes, you could do that kind of thing too. Yeah, that would work out pretty well. Um, yeah, so that's something to think about. Uh, but I've, I've seen that stuff in bat reps, but I've never actually... Uh, maybe I've seen it in the wild, like at a convention. It's kind of heavier resin stuff, if I remember correctly. I, if, if it's the stuff I'm thinking of, that's what I think it is, yeah. Um, thinking about picking up the Sigmarite Mausoleum for my Age of Sigmar collection. Anyone else have this kit? Uh, my friend Jason has the Sigmarite Mausoleum, 
and he painted it all up and it looks really good. It's a really nice kit. I have some of that stuff. I have, I think before they, like the Sigmarite Mausoleum is like a big kit and it's maybe like just two of a smaller original kit. I think I have the smaller original kit, which was just called the Garden of Moor, M-O-R-R. And uh, I have not painted it yet, but it is really, it's a really cool kit, very spooky and stuff and a lot of fun. So, uh, let me see here. I have no time to hobby this month. It's Nano Wirmo. It's a novel writing month. I can never pronounce what that is. Anyway, but yeah, it's cool stuff. Um, I, I, I don't think I could write a novel. I don't know. I've not tried it, so I guess there's that. But I've got friends who do that every November. They try to write an entire novel in like you know 30 days. Um, so yeah, that will that it, that will slow your hobby town down if that's what you wanted to do. But that's fine. Uh, Brian Griffith says that the 3D printer files will be a separate Kickstarter. Well, that's all right. I mean, that's cool, but it just seems like well, see, that seems strange too. Why would you do that? I don't know why you wouldn't just make that a separate pledge level where I I want to do this pledge level and just get the 3D fi- 3D files whereas these other pledge levels which are going to cost a lot more and shipping and all that crap from New Zealand. Anyway, that's it's, it's their business. They're better at it than I am, lord knows. Um Kelly says Adam I've used a lot of things like sawing plastic milk crates off for corner ruins. Etc. PVC pipes and fittings from Home Depot are also a fantastic deal. Paint and you have a great factory setup. I have seen people use like plastic milk crates and stuff like that as buildings. Um, I also have seen in infinity boards, there's like these certain types of boxes or containers you get from a place called the Container Store, which we don't have a Container Store around here. It's more of a, I've seen it in bigger cities, but it's like a, yeah, and they have like these little bins and stuff like that, and people have taken those. And then kind of embellish them and add doors to them and windows and stuff like that. And then they're like, boom, there's a cool sci-fi looking kind of infinity building. And that's cool. Um, I mean, taking that stuff and tweaking it so that you can use it uh, to make terrain quickly, that's always, I think, a good idea. Any kind of hacks like that make a lot of sense. Um, Storm asks, I've heard you use the term sponge paint. How do you sponge paint rust? So, like... If you ever get, okay, um, let me grab this here. So, let me get my headphones off of it. This is uh, like a tray for, you know, putting your models in. But it's this type of spongy stuff. So, if you ever buy a tray like this, that's what they call pick and pluck, where it doesn't already have holes cut in it. It's just perforated and you pick out the parts to make the holes the size, like custom size you want so you can put your whatever thing in there. Um, save that stuff that you've plucked out. Don't just throw it away because that type of foam is really good for sponge painting. So what you do is I generally take like a little piece of it and like pinch it between my fingers. So there's just like some of the sponge sticking out between the fingers and then I kind of poke it in some dark brown paint. And then uh, I brush a bunch of it off on a piece of pa- uh, paper towel. Oh, it's like, kind of like dry brushing. So you want to have it so there's not much paint left on your piece of sponge that you've got tightly pinched between your fingers. And then you just sort of poke along the edges. And you want to kind of rotate as you're doing it because it can almost become like a stamp. So if you keep doing it at the exact same angle, you sometimes will have the exact same kind of shape of dots just repeat it over and over again, and it looks weird because it's the same shape over and over again. So that's why I poke at different angles and turn it, and then it kind of works that way. So you're just doing it. I usually do sponge rust like that along the, the edges where, like, if it's a, a vehicle, anything, just look at it and go, where would, like, if this rhino, this Space Marine rhino was driving through a jungle, where would all of the branches and crap hit it? And like knock stuff off, and like knock paint off, and then therefore the rust would stop, would start underneath the paint, along the leading edges, along maybe the top, along any corners and edges. That's where you want to start with rust. I'm going to make a video about sponge painting rust eventually, but um, you kind of do that. And I generally start with dark because if you ever look at like a piece of construction equipment, like a backhoe or whatever like that, at uh, you know out on the street. They will almost always, unless they're real new, have some rust on them. And then you can look at it and go, well, here's like old rust, which is real dark brown. And then here's more recent rust, which is usually skewing a little bit more towards orange. And then maybe like here's recently where paint was knocked off because it bumped up against whatever. And that part is still metal underneath. So when I do sponge rust, I start with dark brown. 
and I do more of it, and then I do less of it in those same spots. I overlap and put the orange on top of the brown, but I do a little bit less of it, and then I will even do some silver here and there too. So uh, that, to me, makes the, the stuff look good. I don't have... I have a picture on my phone right now, but I can't really show it to you. I would have to. I should have set, put it in here ahead of time. But that that for me works really well for Rust. So, um, let's see here. VJ Morph says, "Does one color, does one coat of color shift paint count for three colors minimum for tournament play?" Uh, probably not. I mean, it could, but probably not. JP Got Rocket says that tray also holds bourbon. Uh, yes, that's true. That is very true. Very, very tiny little bourbon bottles. But no, it was, it was, it, it, it's a bigger uh, bourbon bottle. Um, and I've also used it for carrying. I think that some of my uh, Age of Sigmar Spooky Boys are in the other tray that's sitting over there too. So yeah. Um, let me see. Slev was saying you can also use makeup sponges. The thing about makeup sponges, the reason I don't use makeup sponges for rust like that is because the cells are so tiny and small. They're great for blending, I'm assuming. Well, I actually I used makeup sponges when I was in high school. I was in a play, and um, so like someone would have to put the makeup on me. But I kind of had like a like a, I had stubble. I don't think I had a full blown beard, but I did have stubble, and they would it would rub off a lot, and you would get all kinds of bits of sponge all over me but I've always most makeup sponges that I've seen have been very 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 tight cell smooth sponges and then you're not because the 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 texture of the sponge is what's making that kind of speckliness to the rust so that's why I've not had luck with makeup sponges I did try one once I don't know where the hell I got it from anyway I had a makeup sponge from somewhere um it may depend. There may be makeup sponges out there that are a lot more open cell, but the open cell is what makes that kind of texture for the rust, and that's why I use stuff like that. Like, it's the same stuff. Like a lot of times, not not these types of blister packs anymore, but the older blister packs that like you know where it's like a piece of cardboard, and then there's the blister plastic on the front, and there's a model, and there's usually a piece of like dark gray foam inside there. I would always save all of those too. But nowadays with pick with pick and pluck, I just save the pick and pluck, and now I've got foam for days so it's not that big of a deal uh was soren says hey uncle adam have you ever used a model from a different range for a game you love i don't like the greater demon of slash from gw but i found one i couldn't resist oh yeah absolutely i got no problem with that i use um gosh um i've got a bunch of weird models that i found uh, some of them actually from the company weird uh, but other ones just from strange different companies like War Games Foundry or War Games Factory or whatever that I've used for like post-apocalyptic games like um, Wreckage. I've mixed them in with regular Wreckage models. I've used um, GW stuff in games like Age, like Song of Blades and Heroes. I've you know all over the place. I'm not. I don't have any problem with mixing and matching and that kind of stuff. When I run Song of Blades and Heroes, my skeletons. Um, I can run it at conventions. My skeletons are a mixture of Mantic and GW skeletons. And then the models that the heroes all use, those are all plastic, pre-painted um, Wizards of the Coast D&D miniatures. And um, uh, I think that the, the Necromancer is a GW Necromancer and, and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's... I have no problem mixing those models. I don't... Like, if you go to, a, if you go to an official tournament for, let's say, Games Workshop or for... Uh, I don't know, I suppose, you know, Privateer Press and, like, uh, Infinity and things like that, they're going to probably require, a lot of them are probably going to require that you use the right models, but I, it's not that important I, for me, because I don't go to those kind of tournaments, so, yeah. Um, Saint Spicy says, Tamaya Weathering Kit. Tamaya? Tamiya? I can never remember. Um, weathering Kit are great for plastic models, too. Yeah, there's these different um, weathering kits from Tamiya slash Tamiya, uh, depending how you pronounce it, and um, they're all they look like a little makeup thing, like they're like a little plastic thing. They open up like a little, and it looks like eyeshadow, except it's not in general eyeshadow colors. It has the same type of little eyeshadow brush. It's like a little stick with a little kind of makeup sponge on it, and I don't use it. Sometimes I use it for rust if I want the rust to be very subtle. 
or I want to be very dry, kind of subtle rust color as opposed to, you know, actually chipped off paint type rust. It doesn't work as well for chipped off paint type rust, but for like, I want this area to look kind of rusted. It works out nice for like that. Another thing that that Tamaya stuff works really well is they've got an engine soot color, which works great on like gun barrels for um, uh, flamers or melted guns or anything that's like a flamethrower type of gun and you want it to look real grungy and gross or like I mean, even a cannon, certain types of cannons can do that. Um, and you want to have a, like a lot of soot look to it. It's got a very nice matte flat and it's easy to blend. So yeah, those Tamaya ones. I've only ever seen those at like hobby stores like Hobby Town and stuff like that. Maybe Hobby Lobby? Mm, I don't know. Um, Boshek says, I use natural sea sponges from the craft store. Yeah, those would work pretty well too. I just have, you know, whenever I use pick and pluck, then I've got a whole bunch of pick and pluck left over. So I'm like recycling. I'm a green. Um, Robert Hamper uh, says, Kill Team Commander boxes, good deal or no? Um, they're like 30 bucks, right? 30 or 35? Um, it depends. You know, like, there's a, I think there's one with a pain boy. So this is an Orc Pain Boy, and it was, I think it retails for like 26 bucks. At least that's what the sticker says. So if the box for the commander for this same figure is, and I don't know if there is one for Pain Boy, now I can think of it. But let's say you know, it's roughly the same price. You're going to get the tokens, which are you know cool, but maybe not the end of the world. And uh, also you're going to get like some special cards. You're going to get like, that's one of the big things about those boxes, is that they have like a couple extra cards which are not in the rule book. I don't, they're, you know, it's up to you if you're interested in that. That's the only big benefit there. Um, I think that if you were gonna, like if you were gonna buy the, whichever one, like the guy who's the uh, Imperial Guard dude and he's got the like power sword and the plasma uh, pistol and he's got the big funny hat. Like if you were gonna buy that guy anyway and use him as your commander, then buying the commander one from you know like the little box because you get the extra stuff it's not that big of a deal as far as price difference and that's not bad but um i don't think that there are requirements certainly you know you don't need that all you really need is the book you know so you have those stats and all that jazz emily says when are the new t-shirts going to be available soonish uh i've got designs in progress i want to launch them before christmas definitely uh probably I'd love to launch them before Black Friday. I don't know if that's a thing, that people would actually buy them for gifts for people or not, but whatever. So yeah, I'm in the process of doing that. Um, I've got, I think it's three designs right now that I'll probably be launching. And when I do that, I may retire one of the current designs, which might be the Uncle Adam Say Pachow. That one might get retired because it's the least popular. So if you've been looking at that one, you may want to pick it up before I retire it. Um, maybe I'll have a sale on it or something like that. I don't know. I'm not even sure if I can have a sale with that system. I have to double check. I mean, I, I yeah, I'll have to double check. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, that's, that, that t-shirt stuff's coming. Definitely. Um, any pointers for someone getting ready to cast Hearst Arts molds for the first time? Um... If you can, go either on eBay or maybe like to your local Walmart or your, uh, you know, like a Walgreens or someplace like that and try to get one of those back massager things. Like you plug it into the wall and it's big. Um, they'll make like a shiatsu. It's like a handle, right? It's like a long handle. And then a lot of times they go into two, um, I don't know, bumpy things and then you plug it in the wall and you turn it on and you use it in your back and you're like oh yeah and the reason it's got the two things is so it can go both sides of your neck if you can find one of those like cheap on ebay or on amazon or whatever anything like that because the reason i'm telling you to buy a giant vibrating thing that you plug into the wall is because when you pour a bunch of your um molds like if you're doing just one maybe not that big of a deal but if you're doing a bunch of them it's a good idea when you do that you can then, if you get on a tabletop, you can then turn that thing on and press it to the table, and it will vibrate the table. Now, I've seen people even taking, like, going to the hardware store and buying a shelf, just like one of those, like, weird press board veneer kind of crappy shelves that you put on brackets on the wall. Buy one of those, and then buy some, like, rubbery kind of foam rubber and put it underneath it. And basically what you're doing is you're taking this piece of, like, very heavy 
kind of press board board. And then underneath it, you're putting like rubbery kind of legs where you could use a foam like this stuff or you could do something else. that. And so basically what you want is you want that board to be kind of almost a little wiggly. And then you put all your molds on top of there. You pour all your stuff in there and you take this vibrating thing, you attach it there and you make the entire surface vibrate. The reason I'm telling you to do all of that is because then it causes all the bubbles that may be trapped into your molds to like rise up and pop. And then you don't have all kinds of weird bubbly voids and stuff like that. You build it once. You, know, you buy that shelf thing. They cost like six bucks. You find some kind of foam rubber or whatever you're going to use. Um, you can get that at the craft store. You build this. You set it in your basement or wherever you're doing it. You just set it down. You glue the foam rubber to the underside of the thing, uh, to the underside of the, the, the shelf. And then you just stick that shelf on top of a table. And it's being held up off the table by the pieces of foam rubber. And it's got like a wiggle to it now. And then you put all of your molds on there. You pour in all the stuff you need to do. And you take that vibrate thing, stick it right into the middle of that board and turn it on. And the entire board is going to vibrate now. And then all the, um, the bubbles and all that kind of stuff will rise up out of your dental plaster. Also, use dental plaster or resin, but don't use plaster of Paris. That stuff's garbage. Don't use plaster of Paris. That's a very big deal when you're using her starts molds because plaster of Paris is super, super, super um, crumbly and weak. Dental plaster, if you can find it, is super strong. Resin's good, but resin can over time mess with your, um, your molds. It can break them down faster. So anyway, um, that'll work out well, uh, I think. Um, I've been not able to find yet a good one of those that has the two heads that's good for the back of the neck because then that way you can just set it on there and it will... I saw a guy on one of the forums when I was looking at the Hearst Art stuff. He took some what's called plumber's tape, I think, which is like a metal strip that's got holes in it, and he just put it over the top of the thing and then screwed it down on both ends to the table and then ran the cord off so he could just turn it on. It would just vibrate the whole table and it was fine. So anyway... Um, it's not super crazy expensive to do, but if you're going to be doing a bunch of it and you don't want bubbles in your stuff, that's the easiest way to do it. The people will tell you, oh, just bang on the table with your fist. Eh, it doesn't work as well, and it's kind of noisier, and uh, you can hurt your fist, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, uh, it's a little after 11, and I've been talking a little bit long about um, vibrating tables. But uh, I'm glad that you guys came and talked, and we talked about... Uh, terrain and I got to show you a bunch of cool pictures of some awesome terrain that I saw at Valhalla I hope that some of it was inspiring to you to embellish and make your um, terrain look a little bit more um, real or maybe fantastical or whatever but that kind of stuff can really make the terrain pop so anyway um, thanks for watching and um, I will see you guys in another two weeks and we'll talk about more stuff and Let's see, two more weeks. Is that going to be past Thanksgiving? Maybe just before, I think. So, I don't know, maybe we'll talk about Turkey uh, or something. Uh, next two weeks, yeah, it'll be before Thanksgiving. It'll be the Sunday before Thanksgiving. It'll be the 18th of November. So, whoops, I hope I can see you folks all there and have a good rest of your day.